Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the January 5th, 2021 regular um, session of school committee. Um, we are meeting remote due to COVID-19 closure. Um, I'll walk through the agenda for everyone. Uh, we will start with uh, public comment. Um, actually, before public comment, we'll start with student report, which was omitted, but uh, we always have student report and we always do it before public comment so our student can uh, get back to school. Public comment, reports and discussion items. We have uh, FY22 draft school department budget. We have COVID-19 district update. We have actions items, vote to approve the job, revised job descriptions. We have some gifts we're going to approve, chair report, superintendent report, some future agenda items uh, and future meeting dates. Um, I would like a motion to uh, allow the student report, which is not on our agenda. Um, so suspend our rules and allow that if someone would make such a motion. So move. So move. Somebody second? Second. Okay. Roll call vote, Ms. Bolognese. Aye. Ms. Bergstrom? Aye. Ms. Marchant? Aye. Mr. Nixon? Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you all. Um, welcome, Evan. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, you know how these things go. Uh, welcome. We are excited that you're able to come here and uh, give us a student report. Uh, take it away. I'm honored. <laughs> I'm excited to be here, too. Thank you, guys. Um, and Happy New Year to everyone. Um, yeah, so uh, not much going on at the high school at the moment. Um, it's our second day back from break for AA and BB hasn't been um, back in the building yet. So things are just starting to pick back up. And sorry, I don't know if you can hear my dog barking in the background. Um, okay. Including sports are just starting to pick back up. Um, I know Nordic team has our first race today and I think other sports are starting to get competitive too, according to MIAA standards. Um, the academic quarter will end on January 22nd. So um, teachers, a lot of students will be having projects and stuff due then that we're working on since, that we've had since break. Um, now uh, is the time for most college applications due for seniors. So it's a bit of a stressful season, but those deadlines should be passing the next few days and weeks. Um, in addition, we have the juniors. Um, there's a standardized testing information night for parents coming up for them who just took the PSAT and got their PSAT scores to talk about standardized testing going forward and for the college process. And um, registration for the national language exams um, is also opening to all students currently at the high school, which usually happen in um, March, I believe. So that um, will be opening up now. And then students can register for those, take those tests, and those are awarded on like national levels, which is a very cool opportunity. And I think that's all I have. Thank you very much. Are there questions for Evan from the committee? Ms. Bolognese? I have a very basic question, I think. The national language exams that you mentioned, are those um, just for uh, like the juniors and seniors or are they for all years? Those are for all years. So every language has their own test and their own like specific rules, but it should be that every student, any student can take their test. Any other questions? So Evan, I do have a question this year. Um, uh, I know that there aren't going to be midterms at the high school for the first time in many, many years, I imagine. Um, what are your thoughts about that? And what are the thoughts you're getting from um, your fellow students? Obviously, it's nice to have, I I'm just throwing up my own thoughts. It's nice to have those extra days, but I don't know if some people count on a midterm exam or just happy to see them gone. Any thoughts from others and yourself? I think most people are just relieved. I think it would be a lot, especially right now. Um, for example, based on the timeline that we have, I think that would only give people like a maximum of four classes in school um, after break before midterms. So it would be a lot of work to cram into one exam. Um, I know that some teachers are just giving longer creative projects, I believe, instead of midterms that might be worth more, which is definitely better for us because we do have those off days to work on that. Whereas you can't, like if you have a test during one block, you can't just do that. Um, and I do know also that um, for most students, we've had all of our tests crammed into the two days that we're in school. So for me, Monday and Tuesday, I have tests all, all the time. So I think um, it's very appreciated for students' mental health and for the teachers with their curriculum planning that they don't have to schedule a whole other big test with the review that goes with that and such. I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. And that goes along with what I would have anticipated. But every once in a while, um, I anticipate something and I find out that the students think the total opposite. So I'm Glad to sort of have you as sort of that, um, you know, dipstick measure. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Seeing none, th thank you so much, Evan, for coming. We really appreciate your attendance. Uh, 
as always, you're welcome to stay as long as you would like, but also you get back to the grindstone. Thank you. Have a good day. Uh, with that, we will move on to public comment. Um, before we begin public comment, I just want to remind everyone, as I always do, this is a chance for members of the public to express their opinions on matters under the jurisdiction of the school committee. It's not a dialogue and the committee is under no obligation to respond to comments. <clears throat> I'm going to try as always to limit co public comment to 20 minutes and limit individuals to three minutes per person. But the briefer and more succinct you can be, the more individuals we can hear from. I'll begin public comment by uh, uh, lowering all the digital hands so everyone has a fair opportunity to speak. And then if you raise your digital hand in Zoom, there should be a button on the bottom that says raise hand. We'll call the people who have their raised hands. So I'm going to start by lowering all hands. <clears throat> which I have just done. And if you would like to make a public comment, please raise your hand. Sorry, that was kind of a mouthful. I will close public comment shortly, um, unless someone um, uh, has a desire to uh, give a public comment by raising their hand. Seeing none at the moment. Seeing none as well. <clears throat> I just wanna remind people that after we close public comment, even if you raise your hand during the meeting, we will not recognize anyone who raises their hand. This is the opportunity for members of the public who wanna speak. Seeing none, I will close public comment and uh, Thank you all for coming. Uh, Ms. Dr. Ellen Emma. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if we could move the agenda item about the grants to earlier in the meeting so that um, Carolyn Plosky can share with us about the grants. Uh, I would be delighted to do that. And in fact, I think that it would make sense to um, move all of the approval of gifts um, so that we don't jump around. And I would uh, welcome a, a motion to um, move the approval of gifts, and then we can go in any order of those approval uh, so that um, uh, Ms. Plosky can go in the order. So I would welcome a motion. So, so moved. moved. A second? Second. Uh, roll call vote, Ms. Bolognese. Ms. Bergstrom. Aye. Aye. Ms. Marchant. Aye. Mr. Nixon. Aye. Chair votes aye, vote is unanimous. So we will move um, to approval of gifts, and then we will return. Um, uh, I have no problem with going in any order of the approval of gifts. So I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm out of order in my packet. So give me a second. And then um, uh, Dr. Ellen Emma, if there's a gift you'd like to start with, we can certainly do that and then go to any of them. I'm not- um, Great. So. Thank you. So um, we'd like to do the gift um, on the project with the books and um, Carolyn Plosky is here in the audience. If someone could elevate her, she'd be happy to share about this exciting new project we're doing. Certainly. Um, sure. And, and uh, if you would like to uh, work on the uh, looters uh, donation first while you're you're raising uh, oh, Carolyn. We just we just got Ms. Plosky. Okay, you got her. Good. That was <laughs> okay. Thank okay. you so much. Welcome. Right. Thank you for Thank coming. Thank you, I appreciate your altering your schedule so that I can get back to the classroom, but I did wanna take the opportunity to introduce the uh, grant that we have proposed. Um, so I had applied for these grants in order to fund a student book club at McCall and a student book club at the high school for the purpose of recommending diverse texts for potential identified grade level curriculum, summer reading or personal recommendation use. And while teachers have definitely had their finger on the pulse of compelling text, there's absolutely nothing like the recommendation of a peer. It's really powerful. It's really powerful to include student voices in this process. And we found that students are really eager to learn about contemporary diversity in our world. And they speak literature that allows them to see those windows and mirrors and sliding glass doors. The goal for each of the club is to meet twice a month for three months, overall reading five books each. And the Network for Social Justice is partnering with us to facilitate kickoff meetings where we will determine our goals and how to assess a book, a process that is informed by the department's ongoing professional development work, particularly with teaching tolerance. 
And while student book club members will use the books for this time period, the books will ultimately become part of the department's curriculum inventory, books that we donate to students in need of summer reading selections or classroom libraries, depending on the book club's recommendations. We've already received extensive interest from students as well as a long list of recommended titles from the school and greater community. The hardest part of this process is selecting interested students and eliminating potential titles. In fact, we can see how this experience could become a regular rotating community and a living document for titles for teachers, students, and family reference. I'm so appreciative of the support from the Network for Social Justice the MPA, the PFA, and all of you who make this possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Plosky. Uh, Dr. Ellen Emma, do you have anything you want to add about this grant since both you and Ms. Plosky are here to present? Uh, now, really, Carolyn has spearheaded this, and it's, you know, exactly what we hope for in our next steps around social justice and diversity of text and doing more with student voice. Um, I think this is a very powerful project and so excited to see it get off the ground. So thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Excuse me, Ms. Plosky, we're also neighbors. So I, I, my apologies there. Um, uh, are there any questions uh, from the committee? Ms. Marchant. It's more of a statement of gratitude. This is uh, an immense opportunity for our students, not only to uh, read a variety of books, but also to reflect on which ones will reach more students. And so that that responsibility that they'll shoulder as book club members is, is a rewarding responsibility. And I, I look forward to seeing those lists. And it's exactly like we've been talking over the years about differentiating and the opportunity to open up the world to these students. And, and so I'm deeply grateful to you, Ms. Plosky and Dr. Ellen Emma and the network for taking this project on. I hope to see it grow in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marchand. Ms. Bolognese. Ms. Plosky, do you have an example of some of the text proposals that have come up? Sure. We've had many people um, input titles, um, some of which I had never even heard of. So it's wonderful to open up the opportunity to, to contribute to that. Um, so some of the ones that have made some of our final cuts are um, Every Falling Star, uh, Apple Skin to the Core, The Poet X, Harbor Me, uh, Hello Universe. And that's just a, a sampling. Um, so you know, most of them include people of color simply because of the, the climate of our country right now. Um, but we're also looking for, you know, socioeconomic diversity and um, those with disabilities, uh, you know, the LGBTQ community, those with mental health issues, um, or we could go on, but, um, you know, our, our definition of diversity is quite broad. Thank you so much. I can see myself adding to my own reading. <laughs> Thank you. Additional questions, Mr. Nixon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, two quick questions. Is this initiative's funding, this is really to Dr. Ellen Emma, is the funding for this limited to the amount of the gift, which is $1,200, or are we supplementing uh, with some departmental funding? Um, that's part one. And then part two, given however much funding is really going into this, whether it's limited to the gift or it includes some supplement from the budget, I'm just curious to know physically how many books are we actually trying to get since this is about physical texts in the hands of students. How far does this take us? <laughs> so I'll let Carolyn speak more to part B to part A. I think, you know, if there, um, if there is a more of an interest than we have like a capacity for, then certainly I think we can match with some of the curriculum funding um, from the district account. Um, and if this could just be, Carol and I have talked about too, but this could just be phase one, right? So if this takes off and this seems to make sense, then it's a, like an opportunity for a pilot. So we can continue to do pieces through the budget um, in terms of the student piece for them to read and have voice, but then obviously it will also have budget implications if we decide to move forward with embedding certain new text and rotating that into the curriculum. Um, as a sidebar, Carolyn's also been doing some neat work with looking at some more digital 
um, ways to do things too. So that's part of as our budget planning goes forward with that as well. Um, to answer your question about how many books this initial grant will obtain, uh, it will obtain 100 books. So our goal is to have a club at McCall and a club at the high school of about 10 students each, and each of those students will receive five books. Um, at the moment, it looks like that that grant will fund that. Um, you know, it, we're limited by how many adults we can have facilitating book clubs at any given time as well. Uh, we did receive quite a bit of interest. And again, it's really hard to cut students who are interested in this, but it really made us think of this, this can be an, an ongoing community of, of readers who make recommendations for various populations. And um, that, you know, just because a book didn't, it was so hard to eliminate titles from our list. And those are not permanently deleted. Uh, but again, we'll continue on a list, you know, some were deleted because they're only in hardcover and they cost, you know, three times as much as a paperback. So those titles will remain on the list and hopefully we can return to those in some way, shape or form in the future. Thank you both. Additional questions, Ms. Bergstrom. I just have a couple of quick questions. First to thank you because I um, love the opportunity for students to have more um, power and engagement in their own learning. And, um, you know, it, to me, it fits in with the, the whole um, move in our district towards more um, project-based learning and more inclusion of student voice in their own work, their own assessment. And um, so I am really excited to see this project take off. And I thank you for taking it on and engaging community partners in it as well, who may have some experience and expertise to offer too. Um, I'm curious what happens to the books that won't be chosen? Will those just be rotated into classrooms? So for books that will not ultimately be chosen for either curriculum use or summer reading use for, for whatever reason, uh, most likely those will become part of teacher classroom libraries. Most English teachers have extensive libraries that they let students um, take books out of. Your kids might have some of them in their bedrooms right now. And, um, you know, particularly if a group has decided that it's not appropriate for whatever reason for curriculum, there might be a reason where it's destined for certain kids and not for others. And so it's a perfect example of a teacher who knows the students' reading preferences and might connect them with a particular book in their classroom library. Some of those books never come back. And, um, and honestly, that's okay, because it meant that someone fell in love with it, and it's going to be used wisely. So, you know, we, we hope that those books will get into the hands of kids. They're not going to sit on a shelf forever. We intend for them to be circulated. No, that's great that it would, they'd be able to make their ways back in the classroom libraries. I'm glad mm -hmm. to hear that. And then my second question is, is um, about the, uh, the reading level and accessibility of books. Are these including things like graphic novels? Are we making sure that things are, that we're choosing are available on audio uh, as audio form as well? Because I know some of these, some of the books may not have the public market that um, other books might. And so they might not be available that way. How are we gonna make sure the, the books that are being chosen are accessible to a wide range of reading levels and abilities and just interest in the That's way you That's a great question. Read. So yes, we are certainly mindful of that. There are graphic novels that have made the list. They do span a wide range of reading level. Um, in terms of audiobook availability, they all do come in audiobooks, so that is certainly accessible to our students. That was one of our qualifying features when we were deciding whether a title could be included on this particular list. Um, or not. So yes, that is certainly something that we're, we're very much aware of. Uh, one of the processes between getting all of the book recommendations from the community that um, the McCall curriculum leader and I did was look up the reading level recommended by um, either Fountas and Pinnell or the school library journal, just so that we could kind of take a stab in the dark for would this apply for middle school, would this apply for high school? And there's, there's a, a crossover as well. Um, but we gave a, a general range where it would be most and, and that will be part of the, the job of the book clubs as well, because a high interest book, you know, many kids can read at a reading level that they wouldn't otherwise, um, you know, take on. So that's right. where the kids input is going to be extremely important. Terrific. Thank you. You're welcome. Any additional questions? Ms. Marchant? 
Sorry, um, just one additional suggestion. I love this idea so much. And I'm just reflecting on a book I finished recently called King Leopold's Ghost, and it's nonfiction. So I really hope that we can include or expand the program to the social studies, um, humanities departments that we have at the high school and the um, middle school, because those kinds of books are incredibly eye-opening to history that we just never get to in the already jam-packed curriculum. So if you could re please reach out with this model to your counterparts in the social studies department, I would be even more grateful because of these kinds of books also. Sure, I can do that. I want to thank you for the logistical task of actually managing three different um, organizations to provide donations. I know you have to go before each donate, each organization, and they each have to vote. I really appreciate you spearheading this um, and bringing this forward for our town. Um, thank you very much. You're and uh, I would welcome a motion uh, to accept uh, the, the three donations or however we would like to, to do it. I make a motion to accept with gratitude the donations from the Network for Social Justice for $600 and for $300 from the McCall Parent Association and for $300 from the Winchester High School PFA as presented. Second. Uh, I would accept a roll call vote, Ms. Bolognese. Oh, aye. <laughs> Ms. Bergstrom. Aye. Ms. Marchant. Aye. Mr. Nixon. Aye. Chair votes aye. Vote is unanimous. Thank you very much, Ms. Pulaski. Thank you, Dr. Ellen Emma. This is a wonderful um, uh, way to start the new year. It is, absolutely. Thank you so much for your support. <laughs> and, and I'm glad we can move this to the front, uh, you know, get back to those kiddos. I will, thank you. <laughs> Take Bye -bye. care. Um, with that, we will move our, um, to the second uh, uh, donation to uh, vote to accept. Um, this is a vote to approve a donation from the looters um, environmental, and I see that um, Ms. Whittemore is uh, here to present this donation. Ms. Whittemore. Yes. Looters Environmental has been um, historically a supporter of the school district. Um, in past years, they have continuously um, provided us with a donation annually in the amount of $125 to be used by the district as the district see fits. Um, and they have uh, once again generously provided us with a check for $125. Um, I am requesting that the school committee um, accept this donation and um, with gratitude and thank looters for their continued support of Winchester Public Schools. Thank you, Ms. Whittemore. Uh, I would uh, welcome a motion to uh, approve. I'm happy to make a motion that we accept uh, the gift from leaders as presented. A second. Uh, roll call vote, Mr. Nixon. Aye. Ms. Marchant. Aye. Ms. Bergstrom. Aye. Ms. Bolognese. Aye. Chair votes aye, the vote is unanimous. A, a hearty thanks to Loaders Environmental and thank you, Ms. Whittemore, for um, um, presenting. Can I make a quick comment, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Nixon. Um, Leaders has given a gift to the Winchester School Committee every year for at least the past 20 years and may, may well be far beyond that. It's a small gift, but it adds up um, to some significant dollars and it, it comes um, unrestricted. So we really do appreciate it's a small amount, but it's always there. And I just want to say, I really appreciate the generosity. Thank you for those words. As the, the, the most senior member of the committee, you probably remember accepting this gift for a number of years and, and apparently well before your time as well. So uh, nice words, thank you. With that, now I gotta find exactly where we are. I believe we are back at um, the reports and discussion items, FY22 draft school department budget. Um, Dr. Evans is going to provide, uh, and Ms. Whittemore are gonna provide um, a draft F FY22 budget. Um, and uh, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Evans. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, I would invite um, the other members of the central office to chime in uh, if there are areas where uh, they have something um, that is um, um, important for us to know that I forget to share with you today. As you know, the process of budget development is something that doesn't just happen 
in December and January that it's sort of an ongoing effort um, every year as we get ready for Springtown meeting um, and uh, and look at our needs. Uh, and so the budget development process is really driven by um, several key factors. Um, projected enrollment related costs that are in terms of staffing and materials. Um, the FY22 budget is a challenging budget to project because um, projecting our enrollment is a little challenging for next fall, knowing that we'll likely have some bounce back students. We are planning for a full typical opening of school uh, in-person learning. And so this budget is, is um, developed based on that. And then we look at fixed costs, including um, employment contract settlements and transportation costs. Uh, our regular bus contract, uh, there's an assumption uh, of an increase, uh, but that is going out as is our food service contract uh, for next year. Uh, next year, FY22 will be the last year of our employment uh, contract settlements for our four union groups, soon to be six union groups, um, two other small union um, subgroups are in negotiations. Um, and so we know what our fixed costs will be in terms of the contract settlements based on our current staffing levels. So that is something that um, allows us to have some certainty around our staffing costs for FY22. Then we also look at specialized costs like special education, both in and out of district, English learner costs, and uh, programs for at-risk learners, particularly for students um, who are struggling with mental health issues. Then we have one-time costs that are generally related to initiatives like textbook replacement, technology initiatives, professional development, um, and then program improvement costs, um, technology um, upgrades, staffing and materials costs for program enhancement, athletics, co-curricular programs, um, et cetera. Uh, and then those costs that are driven by um, district and school improvement goals. So it's an ongoing process over many months to um, develop the budget, always with an eye towards understanding that um, the resources to support our budget are finite that um, the um, town uh, generously uh, approved an override um, for our operating um, budget a couple of years ago. And we are um, uh, quickly coming to the end of the time when we can continue to afford um, everything that uh, we uh, want and need for our students through the funding that was approved through the override. Um, we also have had a number of district initiatives and I've provided a summary chart for you um, that uh, we will continue to make small steps towards fulfilling that were promised as part of the override. But I think it's also important to look backwards to the last five fiscal years uh, and ahead to the next couple of fiscal years and celebrate the things that we have been able to accomplish um, in terms of budget initiatives. Um, the most important and the one I think uh, we can all be proudest of is our increased support for students' social emotional learning needs that's en enabled our students to not only succeed academically, but also to work towards a healthy balance. In, in accomplishing that goal over the last few fiscal years, we've added parts of positions or positions as adjustment counselors and guidance counselors at the Midland High School level. We've increased nursing support. We've hired <clears throat> several parts of or full positions in um, what would traditionally be guidance counselors, but we call them social emotional learning coaches at the pre-K five level. Um, and then uh, Jason's position obviously was a new position added uh, several years ago. So when I talk about continuing that effort in FY22, as I go through my budget plan, there are two positions I think that are really important that I'll talk more about at that time. One is a uh, high school dean of students and the other is continuing to add to the elementary SEL coaching team. And I'll, and I'll add more details about that, but that's um, a continuation, those positions I've obviously discussed for several years um, and we're not able to be included in previous budgets, but we wanna to continue to chip away at that. Um, we've also done a lot of work to improve special education services, um, particularly in district programs. We've um, improved to support learners. Um, uh, our um, program for language-based learning disabilities, um, our program for um, students with autism spectrum disorder, our programs for the partnerships programs for students who um, are um, experienced, who need additional levels of support, et cetera. All of those programs have expanded and are highly successful and presented on those in the fall. We've also 
we have a highly effective co-teaching model that promotes maximum levels of inclusion and um, is supporting both regular education and special education uh, in very effective ways. Uh, we don't have any specific budget initiatives for special education for the FY22 budget, but um, I expect in the years uh, subsequent to the FY22 budget year, uh, there will be continued expansion of in-district specialized programs. Similarly, we've made a lot of strides with curriculum. And as you know, our curriculum guides that are published on our website outline our priority standards uh, for the current year, and we'll continue to work on those. But Jen Ellen Emma has really worked hard with teams of teachers um, and district um, uh, administrators to um, have a, a curriculum alignment um, across uh, our elementary schools and, uh, and an articulation from middle to high school that I think has really supported student learning. So there is no specific initiative in that regard, but I have been um, very pleased with some of the efforts that we've made around um, purchasing more diverse text and materials, as you just heard about this grant, um, our work with MCIEA in terms of improving assessment um, and expansion of elective programs. So we have um, a highly successful drama program, for example, that, that we've begun uh, that we hope will continue uh, in subsequent years to expand. i make a point of information to sure. Dr. Um, as you're going through this, it, if, if you have a document that you'd like um, to share so that the public can see, I know you've shared some information with the committee on initiatives. It's very helpful. Um, maybe someone could let you share a screen. I just want you to be aware. I don't think the public is seeing any document. Right. Well, I, I do. I do have a PowerPoint that talks about the budget in general. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to put this out, out with uh, the budget um, backup um, materials. Um, but I don't have it as a presentation okay. document. I'm, I'm talking just in general, sort of historically. Um, and then I'll go, I'll go to more specifics about what is included in the FY22 budget in a minute. So I understand it's, it seems like a lot of text, but I think it's, Thank you. it's important to place our accomplishments in perspective um, as we face a potentially tight, very tight budget year to celebrate what we've been able to do. And it has been over the course of many years. And so I think, um, I think that's helpful. Similarly with tech, and I, and I guess also, um, making sure we talk about what's not in the budget and, and why it's not in the budget. So uh, technology replacement um, and expansion uh, is something that our partnership with WIFI and others um, has really helped us to address long deferred needs for hardware and software upgrades, um, technology initiatives, um, and particularly the hiring of technology support personnel to support the instructional use of technology, the um, transition of our student information system to a web-based student information system, all of those things that we've um, been working so hard on in the last few years really uh, placed us in a very good position to transition quickly to full remote learning as we needed to do in the spring. While there are no specific budget initiatives in this area, it is something obviously that we continue to look at um, and learn from, particularly the expanded use of software that we've um, relied on during this uh, pandemic. Similarly with world language, we're really happy with the movement of our world language program to sixth grade and the expansion to include a non-Western language in Mandarin. While we'll add likely portions of positions, um, the world language program is uh, alive and well. And uh, at this point, we're not anticipating adding any additional languages. So no specific budget initiatives in this area. Similarly, uh, our implementation of tuition free full day kindergarten uh, in FY21, we added full-time aids for each kindergarten classroom. Uh, there's no additional expansion in this area, but it's something I think that really is giving our students a very strong foundation. Uh, support for teaching and learning has um, been something we focused on with the addition of instructional coaches and coordinators at the elementary level um, and expanding service learning in the district. There are no specific initiatives in this area, um, but there are um, certainly expansion of opportunities for those folks to learn very important lessons. And as Jen LNMS says frequently, to make sure we look for the silver linings um, in the pandemic, the ability for collaboration, uh, the requirement for collaboration has been um, something that uh, we've really been able to take advantage of in terms of using technology for meetings, bringing people together across the district. 
and the um, coaches and the coordinators have really been foundational to supporting pandemic learning. Uh, and finally, central uh, the central office, there is a new position. I'll talk a little bit about a proposed additions, addition for an operations coordinator. So um, in summary, I guess what I would say before I kind of announce what I'm proposing for the FY22 budget, and this is the first public look at that, I think it's important to put it in perspective uh, in terms of all we've accomplished in the last um, five previous budgets in, in, in my tenure here and also um, well before I arrived and understand that in any given year, we may not make as much progress as we'd like to in terms of initiative and program improvement, but um, that, that we do have a long-term vision for what our district uh, should and could be. And we'll continue to um, address that in FY22, FY23 and FY24. So that's kind of the introduction to um, the FY22 budget proposal. Uh, and now I will share a brief overview on my screen here. If I can get this. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes, we can see it well. Great, thank you. All right, so this is our preliminary staffing and expense request. Um, and um, I have to give tremendous credit to Ellen Whittemore, who is the one who crunches all the numbers behind the scenes and makes sure that everything um, adds up to what it should. Um, this is truly a team effort, although the principals and other central office members who have responsibility for individual budgets uh, do a lot of work in advance talking about needs um, and, and projecting forward. Um, and some of the um, particularly some of the personnel positions included in this proposed budget will um, may or may not come to fruition because they're based on a lot of assumptions um, uh, about needs for next year, many driven by enrollment related needs. So I'll talk my way through that and happy to answer any questions as we go. So uh, much like every budget year, we start with the big numbers. Um, the approved budget for FY21 is slightly more than $56 million. It increased slightly uh, at town meeting to, um, to address some unmet needs that we um, had proposed. Uh, I am proposing that we increase that budget by slightly more than $2.2 million to have a budget of $58,286,521. Uh, this preliminary budget increase is slightly above uh, 4%, uh, which is very typical and in line with um, what our approved budgets have been for the last uh, five fiscal years. There are always two components of every budget, the personnel costs and the expense costs. And so I'm going to walk you through uh, the um, proposed uh, personnel adjustments. The biggest cost, obviously, is taking our existing personnel and moving them forward. Those are contract related adjustments, um, primarily driven by um, the step in lane uh, kind of uh, collective bargaining agreement that we have uh, for not only teachers, but clerical support staff, special education supervisors and others. Um, and the contract adjustments are known. Uh, we take our existing personnel uh, we, we make some assumptions. Uh, those are net of uh, some anticipated retirements. And if you have questions after I go through with um, what Ellen has um, built in there in terms of retirement, she can summarize that for you. But in general, the contractual adjustments are the biggest single um, budget driver. Uh, then we have a number of enrollment related positions um, that I'll talk through, primarily enrollment related at the elementary level. Um, as I presented at a previous meeting, we have likely a need for several additional elementary teachers because we expect um, with the advent of uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccines and continued um, work to uh, manage everyone's health that we'll be able to open uh, in the fall for all students. And we expect that some students who had deferred kindergarten or first grade or who have gone to private schools um, will come back to us um, if we're able to offer full-time education. We have a slight uh, a request on the um, program improvement side. That is the SEL coach K5 that I had talked about. Um, and then a new position 
in operations to support central office, bringing the total to 1.6 million. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's the single biggest uh, driver in our, in our budget increase. On the non-personnel adjustment side, uh, the, the single biggest driver on that side generally is special education. Um, and we're going to anticipate a very significant increase in out of district uh, tuition. Uh, we generally build in a 5% increase for existing students. Um, uh, the state approves the uh, tuition rates uh, for out of district um, students. Um, and so we've built in an increase there, but the primary driver here is a larger than anticipated number of students who have been placed or ex we, we expect to be placed in out of district um, schools um, because their needs are complex and, and, and uh, particularly with the pandemic, um, we're seeing some students who um, might otherwise have had their needs met in school are now um, uh, being moved to out of district schools. And so the out of district tuition is really um, a combination of regular increases for those students already placed some students who have been placed since the last budget was approved, and some students who we anticipate will be placed who are, um, who are not making uh, adequate progress in our schools at the present time. Also a slight increase in out of district um, transportation, $51,000. Uh, Ellen has built in a small anticipated increase in regular transportation. Obviously the regular transportation budget, uh, whether we will continue to offer full K-12 busing, uh, in-district busing, whether we will continue to bus to um, the Mystic School, all of that is sort of a separate discussion. Uh, this is just uh, uh, an annual increase um, based on existing busing, busing. And uh, again, Ellen can talk about her assumptions there. There's also a slight increase in athletics. Every year, athletic costs go up. Um, and this assumes we will not, will not raise fees, but if we were to need to offset um, the budget increase for athletics by raising fees. That's something we talk about later. Preschool tuition, um, transportation fees and athletic fees are always something we talk about once we get a better idea about what the state and local resources will be to support our budget. And finally, some other miscellaneous um, increases uh, that uh, I will outline later. So on the Expense side, the main driver here is out of district tuition. So these uh, additional personnel requests um, that I've built into this budget include three elementary teachers to um, bring us to 113 sections at the elementary level. Uh, that would be a cost of slightly less than $200,000. Um, this assumes that most of them will not be, um, uh, uh, that will use all 113 sections. We'll have a better sense in May um, once we have preliminary kindergarten um, and first grade enrollment uh, where we stand in terms of needing uh, elementary sections. As our um, number of sections is really driven by two things, available space, um, limited by available space, and also uh, what, uh, which one of our five elementary schools our students um, are moving into. And we've had lots of discussions about building projects, some of which will come on board sometime in FY22, but the vast majority will really affect us for the start of school in FY23. Um, and in that case, we could see a considerable bump of a couple of hundred students um, district-wide uh, for additional uh, housing units that are coming online. Uh, also, we have uh, program improvement, although you could say that this is also driven by enrollment. I um, want to remind everybody, we have over 1,400 students at the high school, um, and they have very um, varied needs. Uh, we only have really three administrators, two assistant principals and a principal. Uh, it limits the principal and assistant principal's ability to provide as much instructional leadership as we'd like to support the teachers at the high school. Uh, we, we could use another um, administrator. We've talked about having a dean of students who would have as his or her sole responsibility um, supporting students um, who are having behavioral or social, emotional or family difficulties. Um, and so that's an ad that we've asked for for some time that we had not been um, successful uh, in funding. We'd also like to add uh, the fourth uh, elementary uh, SEL counselor coach 
our, our ultimate goal is to get to five, one for each elementary school. It's very typical in other districts to have a, a counselor assigned to each of the um, elementary schools. Um, and so uh, we'd like to get there. Um, we think that it has been a tremendous benefit, particularly in the pandemic. Um, the counselors and coaches at the elementary level support staff members and students and families. Um, and I think it's been highly successful as a model. And so this would be an additional add. Uh, a new position that uh, Ellen Whittemore and I have discussed um, has been um, something not that has had not been previously asked for, but that we see an increasing need for. And that is to relieve some of the pressure both on the Department of Public Works and the school district um, in terms of additional support for operations. Uh, uh, Ellen Whittemore's job encompasses finance and operations, which means she manages food service, transportation, facilities, budget, payroll, uh, et cetera, uh, paying, paying, the, um, paying the bills when we order things, uh, doing all of the, um, uh, putting all the paper out when we have a new contract for busing or um, for food service. It's just an overwhelming job for one person. Um, the pandemic has made it quite clear to us that we would greatly benefit from having someone who could um, shoulder some of the responsibility for daily operations for facilities, food service, and transportation. That would enable Ellen to focus more on finances, budgeting, et cetera. Um, and so that's a proposed additional new position. And she and I can answer questions about that as well. And the last uh, personnel request would be uh, provisioning for an additional nurse. Now this would be um, the impact of additional enrollment, particularly at Lynch um, and Lincoln um, is concerning to me. If we have a lot of sort of bounce back students above our normal uh, one to 2% increase per year at the elementary level, we will be completely out of elementary classrooms. Um, and so the plan has been if we run out of space at the elementary schools uh, to move the preschool classrooms currently located at Lynch to Parkhurst temporarily until a couple of years from now when Lynch uh, school has been rebuilt with a new preschool. Um, if we move the personnel from uh, Lynch to Parkhurst for the preschool, uh, that, that will require the hiring of a nurse. I think most of the other staff members can get relocated or shared, but the nurse cannot be shared. Obviously the nurse needs to stay at Lynch and so we'd need a new nurse. So um, we'll know more once we have the enrollment projections in May, whether or not we'll have to do this. I think it's highly likely that it would need to be done at, in FY23, but there's a possibility that we could have to do it this fall. It really will depend on enrollment um, at the elementary level. So next steps is to uh, take a, a look at the recommended budget, give feedback. We have a um, hearing on the budget. Um, after that, we'll do fees discussion and vote once we know what the resources are. We'll continue to monitor enrollment, special education costs. Um, we have been having budget advisory um, meetings. We've had one with the finance sub education subcommittee. Um, we've had some with the town at the town level with the other members of the finance committee and or select board um, and budget really will be an ongoing agenda item probably from now from now till um, through town meeting uh, in May. So happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Um, I will stop sharing, but I can open this up again um, if, uh, if needed, but happy to answer any questions. And again, Ellen and I developed a lot of this together. So, you know, Ellen just jump in if I misspeak. Thank you, Dr. Evans, and thank you, Ms. Whittemore. I know um, that you were in working on this over the holiday break, uh, and I appreciate um, seeing uh, the fruits of your labor. Uh, I would open it up to questions or comments from anybody on the committee, remembering that this is our first pass at this. So there may be some questions that, that we have to get back to us, and there may be some that there are just easy answers. So um, open it up to anybody on the committee. Ms. Marchand. I, I just had a question about an abbreviation in the summary page. It says uh, increased DW tuition reimbursement line. I might have missed 
that explanation somewhere. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't explain that. Ellen, Ellen can explain what that is. Okay. DW is district-wide tuition reimbursement, and that is for um, district-wide um, administrators, principals, uh, people on independent contracts that don't fall underneath the teacher's contract um, who have um, tuition reimbursement as part of their compensation package. Mm, okay. okay. And right. Um, so definitely a need um, as more um, more folks are taking um, coursework and um, moving on uh, with their programs into um, CAGs and doctoral programs. Ah, okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, I just want to reiterate um, something I've supported for several rounds now, and that's the Dean of Students at the high school. Um, as we uh, in public education wanna move away from the model of um, punishment rather than support, uh, this is a crucial role that I think it's incredibly um, important for us to push for and get it done, um, as well as the, the operations support. I mean, our staff has been drowning and working nonstop, as you just heard how Dr. Evans and Ellen um, Whittemore have been working over the holiday, even. Um, they've just had no break. And the, the amount of work that's still to be done in terms of operations around this pandemic is not going to be alleviated anytime soon. So those are two things that I'm really uh, hoping we support this year um, unconditionally. So I hope that the FinCom uh, group and the town meeting um, group support that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marsha. Uh, Ms. Bergstrom. So, and um, the Dean of Students position is a position that I think that we haven't been advocating just for the past three three years or um, in since, uh, since we've started talking about it again with the override, but historically this is a position that the high school has seen a need for back 10 years. If um, you uh, talk to people in the district who have been around quite a while. So I think it's also important to note that this isn't a need that we are seeing um, come about because of the pandemic or just because of our increase students at the high school, but that this is something that we have needed and been um, short of at the high school for a long time. I think that um, sometimes in the community um, that the words Dean of Students, it sounds almost um, uh, a little esoteric and maybe a little private schoolish. So I'd like to give Dr. Evans or Dr. Ellen Emma just a moment um, to explain to the community what the role of the Dean of Students would be at the high school and why we see they're important and even more so now. Sure. Jen, do you have thoughts you want to share? Um, <clears throat> so I think, you know, certainly hearing from Dennis would be helpful more on how this is, as you've said, we've talked about it for a couple of years. I don't know if it's shifted or changed over time, but certainly the idea I think what Zena was talking about is really important across the district, right? That we're trying to think about that we all have um, behaviors or moments or needs that are not in line with what our values are or what we're hoping to become. And so having a role that focuses on that, um, I don't want to say a specific program around it, but that concept of that positive reinforcement of being a support for students, of thinking about the proactive, um, positive upfront ways that we can support so that we're not in reactive mode um, and needing to be in um, consequences in terms of punishment rather than natural consequences that come from our actions and how to learn and grow from those um, and try to make that kind of shift because too often we talk about our students as if they're already adults um, and they're not. They're supposed to be learning and growing and we're all as adults making mistakes and learning and growing from those. So having that extra support to help with that change and that shift and that proactivity, I think is, is what the vision is, what they're kind of hoping for. 
And so that fits in with like our vision of the learner at the high school from the accreditation that we just went through. And additionally, um, this is something that we had talked about with the community as part of the override and was funded as part of the override. Okay. So I think it's really important that we maintain both this and the SEL coach as um, as positions that um, we had really promised the community we would add because it really fits in with our vision of how the district is growing and what kinds of citizens we want to be able to put out in the world who are not just um, good learners, but good people too. Right. I think the only other thing I would add to that is um, uh, that it, it is hard to be um, uh, responsible for um, instructional improvement as well as managing and supporting students and families at the same time. So the two uh, assistant principals and principals evaluate dozens of people each every year and need to get out and get into classrooms and coach teachers and support teachers. Um, and the Dean of Students position is, is designed to be 100% to support students and families. And so while our administrators are torn and pulled in so many different directions, not only proactively planning, responding, um, building the program of studies, building the handbook, et cetera. Um, the dean of students position would be someone who would always be available to students and not pulled in so many different directions. And I think in a school of 1400 with the um, demands that uh, we face um, and our students face on a daily basis, it's a critically important position. Could I ask one more question, please, Brian? Thank Absolutely. you. That was very helpful, Dr. Evans and Dr. Alanama. Um, I had a quick question about the, um, the out-of-district tuition that's mm -hmm. allocated in this. Um, are you anticipating our out-of-district tuition to increase next year? Um, have, does this account for that? If you do, um, will we see that someplace else in the budget? So the, and Pam can jump in on this one as well. So the increase that I've built into this budget is offset somewhat by some anticipated use of circuit breaker reserves. So the actual increase is significantly more than what you're seeing here. But the, we hope that the number that I've included in this budget will provide for the continuation of students who are currently placed out of district um, and, uh, and the students we expect to move to out of district placements next year, as well as the anticipated increase in tuition rates uh, likely to be proposed. There's a 5% mm -hmm. increase in tuition rates for students who are already placed. Um, you know, there's some movement as the year goes on. Some of our students are placed in 45 day um, evaluation placements and it ends up being and out of district placement, sometimes they come back to us. In recent years, um, we've had a number of students who are in out of district placements who've returned to in-district specialized support programs or transitioned into just regular education kind of support. So there is a, a lot of movement, but this, this is a very significant increase. We're anticipating a very significant increase in out of district tuition costs, primarily because there are more students who are in more expensive of placements. So it's not just the number. I think I've been giving you a number if we had 57 students placed in out-of-district placements. Um, and that number changes every single week, up and down, uh, depending on uh, the needs of those students. So Pam, I don't know if you want to jump in and share anything else about out-of-district uh, trends we're seeing or anticipate costs. I think this is one of the hardest things to talk about um, budget-related we're talking and planning um, about nine months and a year in advance. Um, it's a little bit like having a magic crazy eight ball and shaking it and seeing what your answer is going to be. Um, what I can share with you is that I was immensely proud of the fact that our out-of-district numbers were below 50 prior to COVID. And I think that speaks um, largely to the, to the fact that our in-district programming um, was um, uh, top notch, just you know, strong and um, meeting the needs of our learners. What I can say to you is that since the pandemic in March, there have been 12 placements of students who, um, because of the challenges faced with uh, school closures and um, just the changes that have been brought around educationally for them, um, and uh, socially and emotionally, 
Um, I think this is a trend. I would hypothesize that this is a trend that we are going to see um, for a, a longer period of time. By a Thank longer you, period, good. by a longer period of time, do you? Yeah. So not just this year, but looking a couple yep, of years in the future. Yep. Yep. I, I um, when they. Michelle, when we look at kind of more globally, kind of the effect of trauma um, on um, kind of the hurricane, the researches that they've had on devastating hurricanes and earthquakes and things like that on communities in different areas, it has taken upwards of four to five years for districts to repair from that, that break in the continuity. And so, you know, those of you that have had to listen to me, IDEA has not been waived. Um, we are doing the very best we possibly can to maintain IDEA as we possibly can. But I, I don't mean to sound cliche with this comment, but there is still a global pandemic. People are still getting sick. Staff are getting sick. Kids are getting sick. We don't know what this is going to look like or how it's going to play out. So there are other other trigger things areas that, um, that, that we keep really close eye on. So it's not just the out of district, it's also looking at extended evaluations, it's also looking at our number of hospitalizations, our number of um, potential need. Uh, when I say hospitalizations, that often um, triggers tutoring requests. So Jason and I are constantly looking at what's happening, what are we seeing for trends, um, and we are seeing trends and, and there's no way of knowing right now, you know, January 5th, kind of if it's, if we're going to just see a steady, you know, if this is kind of plateauing or if this is going to continue to shoot up or if we have met our highest um, mark and now we're going to kind of come back down. There's just, it, it just is simply too volatile. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, additional questions or follow-ups regarding that or any other topic on the, uh, the draft budget? Mr. Nixon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> so first, a couple of higher level <clears throat> comments and observations. I think, I think Dr. Evans, you know, really ably walked through the many um, new initiatives over the past five or six years. Um, and that's a great story. I would encourage us especially in this time of COVID when large organizations are really sort of forced to reflect on what's truly essential. And sometimes um, organizations find there's maybe a new way of doing things. What, what might we envision is going to be different on the backside of this when there's a vaccine that's widely taken and the, the concern or the threat of infection is, is gone, as I hope it will be. Um, you know, in some years, some committee members have asked on the tail of some exciting discussion about new initiatives, they've asked appropriately, so what is it we're doing today that maybe we don't need to do tomorrow or that we can do less of um, so that it's not sort of perceived it's an organization that's always adding. Um, certainly, we're always growing, so we have to respond to that, right? So if there are opportunities to do things differently and better that give us some perspective on things that we can maybe scale back on and there's an associated net savings. That's really helpful and I think important to talk about, especially, and I'm glad Dr. Evans mentioned this, in the, once again, a run up to, you know, another operating override. So, so it will be very important for administration and the school committee to talk about what we've asked for, what we've received and how we've managed those, those resources. I think that's really important. Um, and to, to that end, um, I wonder, can, am I allowed to share screen, Mr. Chairman, just because I wanted to refer back to a budget document? Um, Absol absolutely. Please do, Mr. Nixon. I can. I think I can do this. Uh, here we go. So I hope everybody, this, this is the, the budget summary sheet that Dr. Evans has shared with us, same format we've always seen before. Um, I, I, have, I have some comments that are really high altitude and a couple that are weedy, so I'm sorry about that. Um, because this was envisioned to be a multi-year operating override that passed, at the top of this budget form, we typically carry the current budget, uh, which you see here, and you see what's being proposed. 
Um, I, I think it might be helpful, uh, Dr. Evans, if we include the FY20 number, um, which was 54,231 and change, because then we can represent what that growth was from 20 to 21. And then specifically, I was actually thinking maybe there's a way we can show what we actually voted it, that January. If the committee will remember, and I think Dr. Evans just noted this, we actually voted just over a 3.7% increase but that's not what we wound up with at town meeting. Remember, everybody took a haircut. So I think it's important, you, you note the increase there right now in this draft, a little over 4%. I think our community is gonna, it, it's helpful if they can see that whatever percentage increase we wind up with in context to what the increase has been over the past year or two, I think might be helpful. I think there's a good story to tell about what we'd said was really essential before and yet we got less than what we said we needed. Um, I, I think that helps us just broadly. Um, I have a, a, a general question. I was gonna scroll down here a little bit. Some of the positions under personnel accounts go back to at least FY20. And I just wanted to observe that the, uh, the Dean of Students position in the original ask for FY20 was $100,000. Uh, I think it was 110 last year. Uh, we would expect to see some sort of increase. The, uh, there, there's also been an increase in the um, adjustment counselor position. So I, I just have a general question, perhaps to you, Dr. Evans, or to Lori Kirby. Are we, what sort of market conditions are we monitoring? I mean, how, how, what are we doing to make sure that the job is appealing from a financial point of view? How do we know we're sort of offering the right salary? Should the position even be funded? I wonder if somebody could speak to that for a moment. Dr. Evans or Ms. Kirby, either of you? Sure. I mean, I can I can get us started, and Lori, if there's anything you want to add. Um, so for these two positions, uh, the and Ellen, can you just refresh my memory? Uh, the SEL um, adjustment counselor position and the three elementary <coughs> positions. What are you um, anticipating? What step and in, in, um, degree? Um, are you budgeting for for those? So for the um, for the SEL position, um, that is a master's thirty step two, and that is consistent with uh, what the um, last hire was brought in at. Um, and then for the, um, give me one second to pull the elementary positions. So generally, we um, try to budget for a master's step two. So so mostly elementary teaching positions before the pandemic were fairly easy to hire for. Um, and for those, so for those positions, we generally um, budget for someone with limited experience, but maybe a master's degree, um, maybe not master's 30, maybe master's two, something like that. Um, and I'll, it, Alan, you can weigh in and, yep. and let me know. In terms of that, you know, Chris, Chris makes a good point about the um, Dean of Students position. This is not a full year position. This is a school year position um, and is compensated about a slightly more than the uh, maximum teacher salary would be. Um, and we obviously may need to increase that slightly depending on the experience level of the person, but it's kind of a beginning administrator role, much like an assistant principal role would be. And so um, it's uh, non-evaluative, so it's strictly student support. So it's no, it doesn't uh, require the level of expertise and the certification of someone who um, we would expect to provide direct teacher supervision and evaluation. So that's why it's a little lower. Um, but in general, I might I just might want to remind the committee that we did a market adjustment um, of uh, our um, teacher for our teacher contract. We did a, we're doing a slight market adjustment, kind of a rolling adjustment for our administrators' contracts. And it may well be that for the administrators' contracts, for us to attract and retain the highest quality administrators in the district, we'd need to increase um, those uh, to at least the median of our like communities. Um, and we had been slowly doing that with some of our individual contracts that we've been adding to um, as we've added new principles in particular. So. Ellen, you want to jump yeah. in? So, so on the three elementary positions, um, those were budgeted at master's four each, and that gives us some latitude um, with hiring someone who is, you know, does come in with a little bit of experience or someone, um, you know, conversely, um, we bring some somebody in lower, we have the salary savings, and that can be applied towards another position. 
Okay. Uh, Lori, is there anything that um, in terms of attracting, retaining, or salaries for any of these positions that you wanted to jump in on? The only thing I would add, when we started talking about this position, we reached out to our like communities, and um, this is a different position. It, sometimes it falls under the role of assistant principal in some communities. Some communities don't have this team of students. So we kind of, you know, took the information that we had, and then, as Judy said, took a close look at what we want from this role, how long the, of a year this role is, and compare it to our um, admin salaries who are working year round. So it's a combination of things that got us to this um, 110. So I, I, I appreciate that. You know, I, I went looking just to be sure we weren't carrying these values flat year over year. So, you know, we, we had budgeted 110 for this position last year, and of course it was unfilled, but it's still, it's an increase over FY20. Um, and Dr. Evans, you mentioned that this would be a non-evaluative position. I know that's how Dennis Mahoney originally envisioned it when he pitched it. My memory, though, is last year we talked about this role perhaps um, helping in the evaluation role. So I, it, it's helpful for me um, just on the subject of you know, what is really the position about and what we expect. It, it sounds like it sounds like this is maybe coming back a little bit more towards the original proposal back for FY20. Is that fair? Well, I, I think what we're uh, looking to be clear about is this um, this position will allow the two assistant principals and the principals to be the primary evaluators. We're probably looking for an administrative certification, someone with the capacity to evaluate. Um, but we really want, at least for the rollout, if we're fortunate enough to be able to hire this person to have this um, be primarily a student focused and family focused role. Um, Okay, so then, and I was just gonna scroll down here because I had another comment under non-personnel accounts. So um, although I think we've, we've, we've certainly come close to saying, Dr. Evans, what the plan is for Parkhurst next year with respect to preschool, I think we've stopped just short of saying that, you know, definitively. Um, the, uh, I'm excited to see photos of the elevator, which I'm assuming continues to go on schedule. Um, but uh, uh, if, if the plan is to have that space ready for pre-K, I'm going to suggest, um, as I think we discussed last year, and understanding this is sort of out of sequence with capital cycles, I think we should consider a Parkhurst non-personnel account um, and focus on addressing any immediate needs just so that space is ready. So if you, if you need it for the pre-K kids, I'm thankful we will have an elevator. We've talked about things like moving you know, furniture, um, uh, furniture, fixtures, equipment that already exists, whether it's at VO or at Lynch to move to Parkhurst. Um, the nurse piece, as you've explained, makes a lot of sense. Um, that seems sort of an inescapable requirement, um, but what else might be necessary in the building itself to support pre-K? Um, I, I think it would be helpful to, to start looking carefully at that and have a line item for that um, because I don't, I, I don't see us getting any funding for that through the through the capital planning committee, particularly given the timing. Right, no, I, 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 your point is well made. Uh, just to let you know that um, the current um, preschool director, Pam, Ellen and I have had several meetings and toward every inch of Parkhurst, uh, we've got a spreadsheet identifying everything that needs to be changed, particularly from the position of uh, Sarah Casey, who uh, who does the, uh, who has ably run the preschool for many years. Um, and she's got her list of requests um, and modifications, but, but um, we have been chipping away at a lot of the spaces. As you know, um, a lot of the space downstairs, which is primarily where the preschool will be housed um, for student space, um, has been fairly recently renovated. Um, and so there are some minor modifications needed to some of the restrooms, um, to the playground outside, to um, uh, a number of other things that uh, will make the spaces more comfortable and appropriate should a preschool um, uh, be put into place next fall. Um, so we, we do have a spreadsheet and we'll, we'll talk through that. Um, but we have addressed a lot of the things like the um, wireless access points and the phone system, et cetera. Um, and so uh, the space itself internally, ex with the exception of some modifications in uh, small scale modifications that I think we can handle through um, existing budget resources um, is uh, is in fairly good shape. 
Um, and so, um, but I, I think your point is well made. It's, it's, it's I, we just haven't discussed it publicly, but we've been doing a lot of planning behind the scenes. Ellen, anything you want to add on that front? I think that as um, we have our next meeting with, um, with Sarah Casey, with Pam, um, and with uh, Mr. Lawson from DPW, and then we bring in Mr. Lawson again to walk with Mr. Wiley, um, the building commissioner, and we take a really hard look, we'll be able to ascertain exact, um, exactly what we are going to need to carry in such a line um, if we can't get it done this year. But I agree with Mr. Nixon on this. Thank, Thank you both. Mr. Nixon, were you done with your questions and comments in general? Uh, I have some smaller items I think I'll follow up on with uh, the superintendent just in, in more <coughs> detail. Maybe just last thing, a clarification on the retirements. I think I, I heard projected, um, but then I think I, I thought I also heard somebody say actual. So can somebody just yeah. clarify that retirements number? Is that based on a historical average? Is that based yeah. on what we know today, this is a weird year. Um, okay. and early, it's January 5th. Um, if I can just jump in, um, it's based on five known retirements um, that we have with people leaving either mid-year or at the close of the school year. And then I built in two TBDs because historically we have two, at least two people who decide um, very last minute over the summer that they're gonna go. And because this is such a weird time, I only did the two, but I'm anticipating that we could see upwards of maybe four. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Very much. Um, Thank you, and Mr. Mr. Chairman, can I do, do does the chair or um, Ms. Whittemore know when um, when does our health care uh, when does when do our health care benefits get renegotiated on the town side? We we don't negotiate health care benefits for our employees. That happens on the town side, but teachers um, yeah, teachers are covered under that plan, and they have there's a cost burden under that plan, which is always a little awkward thing when that when that negotiation sort of happens. Do we know what the timing is for that? Um, typically, the town manager would be working on that um, sometime over the winter, early um, February, I believe, um, because she needs to have uh, numbers for the budget. Um, so I can reach out to uh, Mrs. Wong and ask her and then follow up with you offline if that's okay. Yeah, th that's fine. I'm asking because in some years, you know, when, when there's concern about a sharp increase um, or even uh, uh, savings has happened one year. Um, that's been telegraphed out to the school committee. So I'm just curious kind of where that stands and what uh, management thinks is coming. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Nixon. Uh, additional questions or comments, Ms. Bolognese? Thank you. Um, Ms. Whitmore, could you just clarify for me um, and then also perhaps for our audience, um, with the SPED tuition and transportation um, and out of district tuition line, um, I do, I, if you look from year to year, or if you compare this year's budget versus last year's budget, it seems like there's a big swing. And is that mainly because the number of students who are going, who are going to be placed out of district uh, changes from year to year? Um, and that, I think you had already said that, but I just wanted to make sure that that's what's driving the, that that is what drives our change. And that as a result, you could see a big swing from year to year. Yes, that is and, exactly true. Okay. So last year we did have, we were able to um, reduce our ask because we did have, it was our first year having some um, increased revenue come in um, as well as retained revenue that we were able to use um, from circuit breaker. And we also did have a reduction in, um, in tuition costs because um, through um, the special ed in-house programs that we have, um, Mrs. Gerard was able to bring some students back into district. Um, so, but conversely as to Mrs. Gerard um, earlier statement that due to you know, just our numbers right now, we are seeing students um, who are, whose needs require them to be placed out of district. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then I was just also going to say, um, I think several of the items that we have on our, on this year's budget were also included in the, um, in our commitments in the over, initial override or in the override. And maybe it just might be helpful to call that out on those particular line items. Um, 
since they are things that we had presumed that we had committed to in prior years and that we would still like like the dean of students um and then I just had a question with respect to Dr. Evans' initial or opening remarks. Um, and I know that we were talking, She, you had um, looked at the previous five years and all of the things we had accomplished, which I thought was a great summary. And, uh, we, and you had also looked ahead. And I noted that just a number of those items, um, we don't have a specific budget initiative at this point. And I am just wondering at what point do we and the leadership team and, um, and the administration um, look ahead at these areas that you had described um, and then figure out what initiatives we would like to see in the coming three to five years, just a long-term plan, um, especially in terms of the lessons that we've learned from the pandemic and from remote learning and just some of the challenges that we see in education going forward. Sure. No, I think I think your point is well made that we um, need to continue to um, aspire to improve the district. Um, right now, uh, this is what I would consider to be a reasonable budget um, and defer some things that I think are really important, like additional support for teachers, um, instructional coaches, more professional development, et cetera. Um, but in order to um, meet what I suspect will be the um, overall available resources, um, that, that some of those things have been deferred. But certainly um, every year we should be looking ahead to see what's our three to five year plan uh, to continue to improve the district. And, um, and I know that uh, Jen Ellen Emma has a lot of thoughts on this because she's the one uh, who's on the front lines in terms of planning professional development. Um, she's been managing a lot of uh, the technology related initiatives. And, uh, and so um, it just seemed as though uh, there's a reasonableness factor that we needed to take into consideration this year uh, in terms of our overall ask. Um, but, you know, but I think we still need to continue to look ahead when there are more available resources, what would we um, not only want, but need. I just think it would be helpful to be thinking of that overall vision, right. even if we're just brainstorming with the leadership team and with the administration of where we want to see us sure. going. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bolognese. I have a, a couple of questions um, about things that aren't in here, and I just want to make sure that they are either aren't in here because we don't need them or aren't in here because they are in here and I just don't see them. One is a world language expansion. As uh, Mandarin continues to go up through the grades, do we not have an additional cost at the high school or is that cost being offset by students taking Mandarin instead of Italian? So therefore we have fewer Italian teachers. I'm just trying to understand where that falls. Right, so we did add uh, some uh, parts of an FTE to Mandarin. Those students aren't yet at the high school. They'll still be at middle school one last year. So it was six, now they're seventh, next year it'll be eighth following year, we probably need that at Mandarin, part of a Mandarin teacher at the high school for those eighth graders who will continue. Um, in general, uh, we have added parts of world language positions, uh, our seal of literacy, our initiatives in world language um, have led to the expectation that most students at middle school will take a world language for all three years, and many students at the high school will take two languages. Um, so I would expect that parts of positions will be required in future budget years. Uh, there, there might be a slight increase at middle school, depending on how many incoming sixth graders choose to do Mandarin. Um, but sometimes that's offset by a reduction in another part-time position. So we have part-time Italian, part-time Spanish, part, you know, uh, we have French. So in the four languages that we offer at the middle school, there's a little give and take. Um, and we have hired the Mandarin teacher and I would expect she needs time next year. Um, okay, that, that's that's helpful. So as far as um, at the middle school, um, there's like when we needed to roll out sixth grade and then seventh grade, uh, as far as eighth grade, we won't need to, we're not looking at a, a, like another FTE of Mandarin at middle school. Not yet. Um, not yet. Okay. Um, and then similarly, we're looking at adding uh, three FTE K to five teachers, which is a roughly 3% increase in our K to five sections. Does that hit up against any um, sort of um, 
size of that we need additional services as far as say um, art or music or specialist teachers or gym teachers or that we need additional nurses I mean I, I, if we mm -hmm. increase by three percent that might be well something we can accommodate but it also might be we might be on the edge with one of those and I'm curious if we are you know that's a good question um, uh, it depends we have used some portions of specialist services for to support our preschool program which this year uh, we're not doing as much um, and which we may not do if the preschool program moves to Parkhurst. Um, and we may, we may, Pam and I have talked about, you know, changing the hours of the preschool or looking at um, uh, how we can accommodate the needs of preschoolers without that. So we have some capacity there for services that are currently being provided to um, preschool, the preschool at um, both Lynch and VO. Um, parts of specialist positions move around the district fairly regularly as sections go up or down. Um, uh, the sections I think that I've built in as sort of a safeguard in case our enrollment, particularly in the early years, um, increases. Where, um, where we also will need to shift is if some of those students are second language learners, that's another unknown, whether we'll need to increase that budget. And also reading support, since those are our most challenged, challenging years um, to support students. And so sometimes we shift more resources down to the lower grades if enrollment is higher there. Um, so at this point, I'm not anticipating our overall numbers to be dramatically different from a typical year for elementary, um, but it just may be that it'll necessitate adding sections and at two or three schools that uh, we would not have in a typical year. And so I'm not anticipating adding any specialists, but as we get, you know, as we always do with the budget, Sometimes we have to make hard choices, and uh, it could be that if our enrollment, you know, skyrockets between now and May, um, we'll have to add additional support. Okay, thank you very much. And then um, the last thing that's that's not here, um, but is mentioned in sort of your write-up, is no specific technology initiatives. Can you just confirm? My understanding is that no new initiatives doesn't mean we're removing anything that's currently in the budget. It's still, um, we're just staying sort of level funded from um, what we've been doing the past year. Right. So we've been fortunate enough to use some of the CARES money um, to offset some more typical expenses in technology uh, that are related to uh, supporting distance learning. Uh, and so we can move some of the funding around for hardware and software accordingly. Um, and we are anticipating some additional CARES money that may enable us to address some of that as well, as well as special education needs that were um, pandemic related. Um, so at this point, we're holding steady in terms of our technology replacement plan. You've all seen the five-year plan. Um, we're, not, we're just not jumping into any new initiatives like that would have major costs like changing our student information system or acquiring different, you know, very costly software programs, et cetera. Gotcha, that's very helpful. Um, and my last question is about the operations coordinator, um, a position that I think we need now. Um, uh, so I, I just wanna sort of um, throw this out there for the committee to think about. This is a position that we could use, um, especially now while we're still in the middle of a pandemic. Um, obviously the uncertainty of whether we would be able to fund this come next year, we won't know that until town meeting and town meeting won't be until till May. But I would just like to think about if there's a way to, if we decide that this is a position that we wanna move forward with, if there's a way to move forward with it, um, regardless of how we move, uh, what next year's budget looks like so that we can start hiring and potentially have this um, individual in place sooner than later. Cause I think we could use this, we could have used this person six months ago, but I, I keep on asking, um, what can we do to help Ms. Whittemore, um, who is overwhelmed with work this year? And I'd just like to think about if there's a way to move ahead with this sooner than later. And maybe there isn't, but I just want to throw that out there if you have Sure. Thoughts. So uh, um, Ellen and I have been working on a job description. So maybe we'll bring it to you at the next meeting. and We'll talk about potential costs for the remainder of this year and whether our existing budget could accommodate that. Because this is a this is a typical position in in like districts. If you look at the staffing levels, we are incredibly um, we have a skeleton crew here at central office, and to have one person managing finance and operations, to have one accounts payable person, one payroll person, you know, Lori has one person in HR. Like our whole HR department is two people. It's just it's not sustainable in the long run 
to maintain the level of excellence that we expect. Um, and people are killing themselves, you know, and I, and you said, you know, Ellen and I worked th through the vacation. So did Jen and Lori and Jason and our payroll person. And, um, you know, there are lots of people whose faces you see here who still have not had a single day off since this all, before this all started. And we're not complaining. You know, we've had some issues at central office with some illness and our, in our support staff. And we just sort of have tried to figure out how to manage that. Um, but in the long run, I would be remiss if I didn't add at least this position, um, just because, uh, you know, it, your operations um, just needs additional support. And I especially see the stress also on DPW, where they only, they too only have one person managing all the facilities for the town. Um, and it, you know, to be honest, it, we are keeping our heads above water, but to move forward and continue to improve, they need more support too um, from us. And so, uh, so this position would be a good liaison between us and DPW. So you, used, uh, you, you paraphrase something you said that I would uh, repeat, which is that I think that what we're doing right now is unsustainable. I think it's unsustainable if we want to, if we value and want to keep our existing staff and it's unsustainable to actually provide the services that, that our district um, um, anticipates from us. So I, I welcome an opportunity to discuss this at the next meeting as potentially, um, again, potentially, I'm not, I'm not, I don't wanna jump the gun, um, if it's something that we just don't think we can do now and we have to wait till um, June, I'm okay with that. But if it's possible to have this moving forward, I think this role could be very helpful over the coming weeks and you know months because it would take weeks to hire or months to hire, but we would talk about having someone much sooner. So uh, those were my questions. I don't know if there were additional questions or comments from the committee, Mr. Nixon. So yeah, I just wanna weigh in on your, your request to the committee. I think if we're gonna have that discussion at an upcoming meeting, it would be helpful for us to hear from Dr. Evans, relatively speaking, how does she envision that workload, uh, the relative workload of the operations coordinator split across things like food service, transportation, and facilities? Is my observation is th those are three very different things. Certainly transportation and food service has a really direct student impact. Um, the facilities, there's all sorts of things we do with facilities after hours and over the summer and so forth. So somebody who maybe has a lot of experience in design or construction and, you know, uh, awarding contracts knows nothing of food service and, and how to work with a bus company. And of course, with food service and transportation, those are typically three-year contracts. So where I, where I think I'd be interested in understanding is um, these are all really essential duties, right, of administration. So, um, might it be more effective to kind of focus on one area as an element of support that then gives uh, others in it in in the in um, the administration more time to focus on a couple of other things? I, I just wonder if it's sort of reasonable to say it's it's all three of those things or even something else. So that would just be helpful for me to understand if we carry the conversation forward. Sure. When Thank we you, bring Mr. you the job description, I think that might be helpful. So. Thank Thank you very much. Uh, Brian, Bush. if I could just follow up on that, it would, um, I, I would be curious, as Dr. Evans said, the whole central office team is stressed, and we also have two tech positions on the books, too. Mm -hmm. And um, if we were going to talk about moving forward the operations, I think I'd want to see a timeline on when the two tech positions would also be filled, too, because in a time where we're still relying on a lot of remote learning, um, and management of student information and learning over the technology, um, that would also be critical to have right now too. 100% agree. Uh, any additional questions about this, the, the first draft budget, um, and there'll be more to come obviously, uh, but I just wanna make sure everybody's had an opportunity to um, discuss anything they want to before we move on. Uh, Ms. Marchand. Uh, Dr. Evans, have you had conversations with FinCom around what they are um, foreseeing for the future in terms of how much they're going to support versus not? Have they kind of shown you anything? So we haven't had, uh, we typically have not um, presented at this point in the year to the full finance committee. Um, typically we've had conversations with the um, subcommittee and the ed finance uh, side. The, it's my understanding that there are several new members of the finance committee who are gonna need to come up to speed 
with what our typical school budgets are and what our unique needs are in a pandemic um, budget. Um, we have had conversations with the town manager. So the finance committee is really focused on the town side at this point. What are the projections related to some of the fixed and variable costs on the town side, health insurance, contract settlements, um, uh, you know, workers comp, all of the sort of big buckets that the town manages and also all of the capital projects and the kind of um, ongoing big, um, big efforts that the town is making for improvement on their end. So they haven't focused so much on the school budget. Um, but I would expect that the town manager and the finance committee are looking for us to come in um, somewhere between three and four percent. And um, if there is additional funding that comes in through CARES or some other uh, federal or state source, they may adjust their expectations. So um, I think this is a reasonable budget. I think it's um, affordable. Uh, we may have to pull back on a couple of things, um, but um, you know, I, I've been really proud every year I've been here, my budget has been passed. We get the override passed. Um, we've worked well with the town side to understand the restrictions that they have. And so I think school committee um, uh, and the central office relationship with the town side has been really very fruitful in the past. And so expect to continue to have good, open, honest conversations over the next few months. Yeah, if I, could I just, just oh, go I was ahead, gonna follow up and say that um, I have great respect for the finance committee and I know that they don't sort of, again, I've used this phrase now twice, jump the gun. They don't, don't either. They will um, review our entire budget submission um, and they aren't sitting there um, thinking, well, it's a 2% and we're going to look at it and come up with a 2% in the end. They look at it, they uh, look at every line item and they come back with a recommendation um, and we don't always agree with it, but it's never, it, at least it never has in my now eight years working with them or on them, has it been something that's been preconceived before they come to us. So I, I think that's a very positive sign that they, they really take our submission seriously. Sorry, I interrupted you, Ms. Marshall. No, it's okay. I just wanted to um, uh, make sure that our messaging is very strong in terms of we're in a pandemic. This isn't, you know, going away anytime soon. Our, our staff has been incredible working within the confines of a very conservative budget and meeting the needs of our kids despite that. I, I've mentioned before um, a district in Pennsylvania where my niece and nephew attend, they have half the students but double the budget. And so it, I just want to keep reiterating to make sure that it's heard that our staff is incredible and the more we can support them, the more we give them um, leeway in terms of meeting their very um, uh, reasonable uh, requests, um, the better we'll be uh, as we try to meet all the needs that our students are going to face in the next few years, as Pam said earlier. It's, it's going to be years long to recover from this pandemic. And so I just want to make sure that the, the finance committee and the town side see all the work that's happening and, and, and really can help us and step up to the uh, plate that we're asking them to fund this budget. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Marchant. Thank, doc thank you, Dr. Evans. Uh, seeing no additional questions, uh, thank you for getting this to us uh, on so early in January so that um, I know you were, again, you worked very hard to get to this point and I really appreciate it. We all do. Um, I think we'll move on to the next agenda item. Sure. Um, uh, may I uh, request a, a quick recess? I need, just need to duck out for a minute. Perfect. Uh, I would like to call a 10-minute uh, recess uh, with permission of the committee. I would uh, request a motion in a second, and then we'll do a roll call vote. So moved. I second it. Roll call vote, Ms. Bolognese. Aye. Ms. Bergstrom. Aye. Ms. Marchant? Aye. Mr. Nixon? Aye. Chair votes aye. We will be in recess until 11.21 a.m. And can we be sure WinCam uh, hears this message? I will um, put something up on the screen that says as much in a moment. Great. Uh, although that will take me a moment to do. And I will go on mute until we see you call us back to order.
Good morning again, everyone. Uh, we will reconvene once uh, we're sure that everybody's back. I will stop sharing. <clears throat> I will just want to wait till I can confirm that everyone is present. Some of you like me might have gone down and had a snack. <laughs> Some might still be having that snack. <laughs> so I just wanna confirm that Mr. Nixon is back. Uh, before we begin, and I would reach out to WinCam. Well, once we're sure that Mr. Nixon is back, I will reach out to WinCam and see if we're still um, on air. And it looks like we have everyone back. If I could just reach out to WinCam and confirm that we are broadcasting or have not stopped broadcasting, I should say. We appear to be live on WinCam. Thank you very much, Mr. Nixon. So uh, we will reconvene. Thank you for allowing us to have what turned out to be a 12 minute long recess. And we'll move on to our next agenda item, which is um, COVID-19 district update. Uh, this the purpose is to provide the committee with an update on the COVID-19 district response. Uh, Dr. Evans, I will turn it over to you and I will ask in advance if there are, um, if there's a way you'd like to break up questions for this that you can do it however you'd like um, uh, as far as having just continuous questions, it's up to you how you would like to move forward. Um, so just feel free. Sure, so uh, the report I'm going to give you focuses on three or four uh, areas that uh, we may want to stop um, and discuss. Uh, the first is case counts, data and trends. Uh, in relation to uh, the pandemic and uh, the work we're doing with public health to address that. Um, then uh, funding, uh, additional funding available through uh, CARES. Um, there's very limited information on that. So um, uh, I will present what I know. Um, and then the, the main objective is to talk about our attempts to increase in-person learning and what some of the uh, factors might be that might limit our movement in that direction. And I know that that is um, something that is uh, hard to wrap your arms around uh, when um, from the outside, it looks uh, like we could be moving in the right direction. Um, why are we delaying? So I wanna answer those questions. So the first thing I'd like to talk about, and then I'll take questions is around case counts and data trends. So uh, the town has transitioned to reporting uh, weekly case counts for town residents on the data dashboard, but we'll continue to update daily counts uh, for each of our schools for staff members who may be Winchester residents or not, and students. And I will continue to uh, report uh, those likewise uh, to our school community. We were pleased to see during the break that the case counts were significantly lower than they had been a week or two before. Um, and remained concerned about uh, travel over the break. Um, but we're pleased to see that um, most families who traveled complied with the requirement to have negative um, test results submitted to the schools before students um, or staff members were um, allowed to return. Uh, I will say many more people traveled than I'm comfortable with. Um, I wish that people would not travel um, and um, because I think that uh, the wider community um, rate of uh, 
positivity uh, in terms of uh, test results is very concerning to me nationally and internationally. And so those families who've traveled, um, even though they've had a, they may have had a negative test result, um, travel places everyone at risk when you come back and you, and you may be infected and not know it. So I wish people would not travel. I wish they would not socialize um, and sacrifice for the greater good. However, um, I was pleased to see that people complied uh, in general with our requirement to, to be tested. Um, we'll continue to monitor cases very carefully, as you probably have heard. There are lots of local districts that have moved to full remote because of widespread outbreaks. And I'll say this again, and I think it's something that even the experts um, who are advocating for a fuller return to school just don't understand, that it's not just the number of students who are ill or quarantining, it's, it's primarily the adults in the building who are ill, isolated, or quarantined. Um, uh, public school districts have very limited capacity to provide adequate substitutes, and if just a few people in a small elementary school are all out at the same time for an extended period of time, it shuts us down. And so I'm really pleased to see that our mitigation efforts that the teachers have been um, enforcing, the social distancing, the hand washing, um, et cetera, the, the staying home when you're ill um, have really limited um, school transmission. Um, but I remain concerned about the number of adults who are in contact or are close contacts of uh, COVID positive individuals and that um, forces them to quarantine and then, uh, and sometimes they cannot teach remotely. And so it is, that is a concern. So right now case counts are um, uh, about where they've been um, on a daily basis in terms of active cases, but fortunately all of the active cases on the dashboard are um, students or teachers who've not been, or staff members who've not been in school and thus we're not in school while infectious. So uh, in the upcoming days, we'll continue to monitor and report that. So I'll stop there in case there are any questions on um, case counts or actions we're taking in relation. Thank you, Dr. Evans. I'd like to share, um, there's some feedback somewhere. Uh, I'd like to share that um, our return to school plan um, from last summer called for us to invite um, Ms. Murphy, the Director of Public Health, um, to our meetings every three weeks or so um, through the fall. Um, we are now in winter, so it no longer applies uh, directly, but we did in fact invite her to come today. She had planned to be able to attend and could have provided more information if, if she had any available. She was called away to another urgent meeting at the same time, so she could not attend. So I just wanted to make that clear um, before we uh, take questions on this, this area. And I'll open up to questions on um, case counts and data and trends. Ms. Bergstrom. Has um, Jen Murphy had a discussion with you or the school nurses or public health in Massachusetts about the uh, new, more transmissible version of the virus that they're seeing across the United States and how we are watching for that in Winchester, um, given that in the last 14 days in Massachusetts, the two largest positive groups are zero to 19 year olds and 20 to 29 year olds. So I have not had a specific conversation about um, the uh, strain from Great Britain that has come into the United States. I think all of us are following this, um, that it is more transmissible. I think we will quickly see um, if we start to see school spread because public health has been doing such a good job doing contact tracing. Um, we've been able to identify what limited school spread we have seen um, and identify the primary um, uh, case that's, that has generated a lot of our positives. A lot of the um, cases that we're seeing are siblings of students who um, became positive either through their own social interactions outside of school or through other family members, um, parents, siblings, um, or small gatherings in the home. And so if, they, if we start to see a case where their transmission is more widespread more quickly, I think it'll become evident. I'm not sure there are any spe specific steps that we can take um, in relation to that um, to be proactive. Um, as you know, you know, we've had conversations about um, should we close all of our schools for a certain time period in re response to either increased positivity or um, other factors. 
And what we have decided is that our students are best served if they have predictable schedules and they're in school. Um, in other districts, uh, the extension of the vacation has just enabled the extension of more social interaction. And that is, um, the experts tell us that's the um, worst thing that we can do. And so we know our students are safest if they're at school where they're socially distanced and wearing masks. And so right now uh, we're continuing with the status quo, but we will continue to monitor it. I know that Ms. Murphy gets uh, daily updates from public health at the state level. Right now she's working on um, vaccination uh, for first responders. Um, she's also managing the frequent testing that the free testing that the town has supported. Um, uh, she's working with our nurses on a daily basis to um, make sure that uh, we do the contact tracing um, and follow up on everybody who's who calls an ill to school to be sure um, that they get uh, the right advice in terms of how to manage their illness or to get tested. Um, and so I cannot say enough about public health. Um, they are really the unsung heroes. And just like us, they are a skeletal staff um, and doing incredible work every night. I hear from Jen Murphy and our nurse leader, Jen Markham, every single night and multiple conversations back and forth about positive students or positive staff members or uh, concerns. Um, so uh, our nurses, our nurse leader, public health, uh, working very closely in concert with one another. Uh, we re remain concerned about virus mutation or um, uh, the progress or slow progress of vaccinations. Um, but a lot of that's out of our control. So we're trying to control what we can control, which is the mitigation measures, contact tracing, and sharing um, good information with the public so that they can make better decisions about how to protect themselves and others. I guess, Dr. Evans, I was looking to see if um, you had had any conversations about tightening up any of the practices that we're already using in the schools, such as lunch times when kids are unmasked or staggering um, staggering times of classrooms changing more so there are less students in the hallway or doing anything we can to keep the transmission in schools lower as potentially um, the ability to transmit the virus might increase. Yeah. Um, and I'm so, wondering if we're looking at any of that to try to keep kids in school. Sure. No, I, the, the one thing that Ellen Whittemore and I um, had a conversation about today is um, we have purchased um, oh, over 200, Ellen. You're muted. I saw um, 200. Yeah, two, about 200, 200 large ones and then a small number of um, ones to go air purifiers to go into smaller offices. Right. So we purchased an additional 200 air purifiers and we're, um, Ellen's working with the DPW to measure the square footage of the spaces that are being used for lunch. Um, those are spaces where there's generally good, um, we've done all of the sort of balancing and double checking of all of the air exchanges and all of the spaces and all of the schools as they have done on the town side. But to add an extra layer of protection, we're adding a, a number of air purifiers to each of those spaces just to add another um, uh, safeguard. Um, and we'll be deploying all 200 air purifiers throughout the district. Um, some of our schools have very robust, I think six different air exchanges in an hour. Um, we have had uh, teachers leaving windows open. So in those spaces where it gets really cold, we'll add additional air purifiers, even though they're not technically needed um, as another measure. We have seen school transmission, ironically, in our district, only in individual elementary classrooms, not at the high school level um, and not at the middle school level. Uh, despite having greater numbers of students, they're not in the same place with other individuals for long periods of time like our elementary kids are. Um, and so there are less chance that they'll be infected through casual contact like in a hallway or in a lunchroom. So, I mean, we'll follow the data and we'll make the best decisions possible to keep everybody healthy. If we start to see uh, in-school transmission, we'll meet with public health and um, school committee and uh, see if there are other mitigation steps we need to take. Right now, our six foot distancing, um, hand washing or, or uh, other measures that we're doing um, to keep students safe has been working really well. Um, We've been very fortunate in that when students have become ill or been tested, they often um, have not infected anyone because they're on the off cycle. They're, it's not their two days in school. Uh, that's really our concern with 
bringing students back for more days and not having that break um, because someone could unwittingly be in the early stages of infection and infect others if they're in school more frequently and interacting with more people. Um, likewise, if we reduce the distance that we have, um, we have many fewer people in classrooms. If we were to bring more people back into our classrooms before widespread vaccination, I'm very concerned that there could, uh, we could need to shut down. And I think a lot of people would have predicted that we would have needed to shut down our district repeatedly due to in-school transmission before now. And so I'm really grateful to public health, to our teachers, to our administrators, that they've worked so hard to keep students in school for those precious two days where they're in person. Um, and I'm, I'm really uh, happy that we've been able to do that where many districts haven't come back in person at all. So, um, but you know, I mean, I think, I think your questions are well, um, uh, are important questions and are um, something that we continue to look at. Just like all of you, um, uh, I monitor national and international reports about schools and COVID every single day. Um, and so people are, are sending me articles frequently and there's almost never a time I haven't already read it, but um, I'm not a scientist and I'm not a public health official. And so we do rely on the experts and medical professionals and public health professionals to advise us. And right now, um, today, we're in good shape. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Additional questions on this, this one um, topic or before we move on, uh, Mr. Nixon. Sure, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry Jen Murphy couldn't be with us this morning. Um, I really appreciate every time she joins us, um, as well as Kathy and Shannon and others for these conversations. And I think she's doing a great job as well, um, you know, in other forums like the um, select board a couple of weeks ago. Um, so a question I would have asked uh, Ms. Murphy had she been here. So I'm gonna throw this to the superintendent, but don't feel like you have to address this unless you really have an impression. And I'll go back to share screen. I pulled up the dashboard. Um, you know, one of the things that jumps out at me is our actual case count on a month to month basis. If you look on the chart on the right, our in-person student and staff confirmed cases is more than doubling each month. So I, I guess I have a two, I have two part question um, with the increased. And, and by the way, there's a chart up above that shows I'll scroll up here. You know, our positivity rate looks like it's going down, but again, that's just an, that's based on whoever decided to go get tested. So not being a statistician, I don't want to draw too many conclusions between what this chart shows and what these charts show. So my interest or concern is with more confirmed cases that implies there's more and more contact tracing going on. We, uh, I'm sure some members have read recently, I think it was Ashland, was it, Dr. Evans, recently, I think they just went fully remote at the high school because they were having some compliance issues with contact tracing based on positivity. So I'm hoping that um, our community continues to be receptive to these phone calls. Uh, are we sharing information, Dr. Evans? Are, do our, is our contact tracing team able to do their job? And when I see that these numbers, and there's no other way I can describe them, they're more than doubling every month. So how's that workload being handled? Do we need to, as we did last spring, have a conversation about maybe providing some support to the effort from our school nurses, given that you know we, we don't, don't have all our kids in school every day? Is that something that's being discussed or might be helpful? That's sort of part one. And then part two, um, I don't know what the December numbers are going to look like. Uh, Dr. Evans, do you, I mean, are we, are we, should we be surprised when we see that the December numbers on this blue line are going to be 75 or greater? Is December another doubling of the previous month? And what does that tell us about the, the coming weeks ahead? Sure. So uh, first part of your question is how are we managing the workload? So our nurses, um, Many of our nurses have agreed to work for public health to do contact tracing and off hours. They were kind of doing it for free or um, were working on all weekends. And you might recall that I sent something out to the parent community and said, our nurses don't get paid to work during the vacation weeks. And I want them to take a vacation because they are just working tirelessly. So please don't expect them to process your travel related um, test results until Monday morning. Um, and I got some pushback on that. Why can't the nurses just work on the weekend and do it? And so what I would say is they're already all working um, and processing um, 
the positive results. There's a lot of coordination that happens when a student or a staff member um, has a positive result. The first phone call is to um, our nurses and then they start sort of the internal contact tracing. The public health folks only hear about our staff members if we let them know because the, the results go to the town in which the person resides. Um, fortunately, we have not had a lot of positive cases. It's, it's primarily students rather than staff members. Um, that are reflected in, in this data. I am concerned, but it's following the trends that we're seeing in the state, in the nation, in terms of a rapid increase in widespread community um, outbreaks. And so um, will we see, will we continue to see um, large numbers of students? The most important factor for me is how many students are infected who were infectious while in school, how many students are affected who were infectious while in school and have thus placed other people um, at risk, how many close contacts have we identified and those students then are restricted from attending. And in general, what I'd say is what these numbers aren't showing is that most positive cases have no school close contacts or only one or two. They may have community close contacts or sibling close contacts, but in general, um, because of our social distancing and our cohorting, we've been able to keep the number of close contacts low which means we're not sending whole classrooms or schools off for two week quarantines. We're sending a handful of people, if any. And uh, can we provide enough qualified substitutes to keep our schools open safely? And for the most part, the, these numbers don't reflect those staff members who may be quarantined because they're a close contact. This only reflects positive cases. And so it doesn't, this, doesn't tell the whole story in terms of the stress on our system when we have people who are um, who become ill. And um, I think the other factor that's a little bit surprising is that there are some folks who have mild illness and there are some folks who have very severe illness and carry the um, impact of having been ill for a much longer time period than just a typical flu or a cold. And so I suspect, as Pam kind of alluded to, that it's not only the trauma of COVID-related illness and the impact and the impact on our economy and the impact on our lack of social interaction, there's sort of the psychological trauma, but also the physical impact that is still unknown of the impact of this illness among people who might've had a minor case, but continue to have after effects. And it could have an after uh, effect impact on education. So your question, your first question revolved around are we, are we going to see doubling? It may be, but in a, the greatest number of cases we've had at any one time, typically on average, has been about 15 in a district of you know, over 4,500. Um, and that's a pretty small percentage. If we stud suddenly started seeing wider spread numbers and school spread, that's when I think we would have to jump in pretty quickly and take greater mitigation measures up to and including closing down schools. But right now, I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to continue to keep our schools open safely and have very, very minimal in-school transmission. If we can continue to have community members making good choices, um, then we will be able to keep our schools open. Did I answer all your questions, Chris? Was there anything else that? Um, well, I, you did, I think mostly, I just wanna go back to the, my concern about contact trace. So I wanna be clear, I'm, I'm, I'm not sharing this graph with everyone because I'm trying to suggest there's some upward trend towards in-school um, transmission. I, I'm really just asking from a staffing point of view. Mm -hmm. If you'll notice in September, we averaged about one and a half uh, positive cases per week. In October, we averaged more like a positive case maybe every other day. And in November, we're averaging more than one positive case per day. In each positive case, each positive test mm -hmm. triggers a contact tracing exercise, which is important to protect us, our students, our staff, and everyone in this community. And so my concern is if, if this trend continues, that very quickly we're gonna, you know, we have a fixed amount of, there's only 24 hours in a day <laughs> and contact tracers aren't calling people at two in the morning. Mm -hmm. I wanna be sure that we have the right staff in place to keep up with this, what I, what looks like a very sharp upward trend. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was curious, Judy, if you, if, I mean, if you know, are we going to see a December number 
that's about double. And if, you, if you're not sure, that's fine. I don't want to put you in a tough spot. But if it should if it should come out that we're now seeing more like two cases per day, it just seems to me we're quickly going to outstrip what resources we have for contact tracing. And, and if that should happen, I'd, I'd like to just be ahead of it. I don't want to be caught off guard. And is that something we can support somehow, whether it's with right. our nurses or even with you know, our, our budget. I, I, I don't know. I, I just hope that the right people are having these conversations so that we don't have contact tracers who sort of stop working at 11 o'clock because they're exhausted and they have to go to bed. And, and we're, we're just not reaching the people we need to reach. It's really right. just as simple as that. Yeah. So just to be clear, um, our nurses are working per hour for additional contact tracing outside of school hours as needed. And also the public health folks are contracting with the state level contact tracers um, on sometimes they've had to use those folks. The good part is, is we may have 10 new cases in a day, but we already knew about eight of them because their siblings or family members of people who were, who be, they become positive because they were exposed and are already in quarantine. And if the contact tracing has been effective, a lot of the people who are positive here don't require any additional phone calls because they have already been isolated or quarantined um, uh, because they're, they're a family member. And so the trouble comes and the many, many hours that contact tracing takes is if there's a major gathering where somebody was positive and didn't know it at the gathering, and then you've got to, to contact a whole bunch of people who may have been at the gathering. In school, we have already have pretty tight controls over who students are exposed to, who might be closer than six feet for more than 15 minutes. We have seating charts. We can, we can do that bit. It's the activities outside of school that's really a public health domain and out of our control that could quickly um, overwhelm public health. In other states, the public health contact tracers, the main objective of contact tracing from what I understand is to limit spread by advising people who've been exposed on the appropriate actions to take and following up with them to be sure that they're taking them and advising them if they become ill. The, in other states, people have thrown up their hands. They cannot do contact tracing because the spread is so rapid. Um, and then that really just cuts the knees off of any mitigation efforts that you might have to try to you know, control spread in your community because people may have been exposed and then unwittingly, unwittingly expose others because they're not identified as having been a close contact. The Ashland incident that you referenced that I've read about reminds us that if public health calls, you need to answer and take appropriate action. And if public health calls and you don't tell the contact tracer the right information about who, with the people you've exposed, then those people can unwittingly infect and kill other people. And so it's critically important that people, um, for the greater good of the wider community, um, make the right choices to tell the truth to contact tracers to stay home when they're ill. Um, and, uh, you know, we really rely on our students and our nurses and our administrators to support the overall public health of the community by um, really uh, cooperating. And so, um, yeah, so it's, yeah, public health is on this. They're well aware of the need for contact tracing, but I think that the numbers don't reflect such an increased workload on the school side because most of the people who've been identified are not a surprise. So I hope that is a little bit comforting. Thank you very much. Right. Mr. Nixon, I would just add that um, Ms. Murphy uh, would welcome any questions from the committee and she told me and that she could come to a future meeting. So I don't think we, we don't need to have the last word beyond this. Uh, we can get the last word from her. Um, and then one thing I just wanted to point out uh, as a uh, math major is that the month of September was only started tracking halfway through the month. So in in full in full fairness to those numbers, while there's it's a steady increase, um, the seven uh, in September started on the sixteenth of September. So uh, the the dramatic increase is was in November, from October to November, and there was um, uh, less of a dramatic increase, pretty much flat from September to October, um, because we only see it's only for half the period. So I just want to point that out. Mr. Van Alia, can I ask Mr. Nixon a question real quickly? Uh, if he's inclined to answer, you're welcome to do so. <laughs> um, Chris, are you asking if uh, you don't want the rate limiting factor in us being able to test and trace and be able to keep schools open is staffing? 
So do we have enough sort of backup contact tracers who are trained and know how to get the information they need and to the people they need it to be able to, um, as cases continue to rise, if they continue to rise at the rate we're seeing, mm -hmm. that we have sort of people in the wings ready to go? Is that what you're asking? Well, so reg regardless of the consequence uh, of workload, I want to be sure that we have the right step. We, I mean, the collective we, the community. We, right. I, I want to be sure that we have the right staffing to meet the workload. Right. Uh, both to keep the community safe, keep schools open. Um, and I, I'm just reflecting on conversations we had with Ms. Murphy and, and Nurse Whitaker. I believe it was in late October. We were hearing anecdotally how busy things were becoming. Um, uh, Kathy Whitaker, if folks don't know this, she has actually postponed her retirement, I think twice, um, to, to help out. And she's doing a tremendous job. And I, you know, I get emails from parents in this district who are appreciative because they're getting a phone call on a Saturday evening or a Sunday morning. I mean, people are, people are working hard. I, I just want to be sure that we have the, uh, we have the staffing available to keep up with what this chart would suggest it's going to do in the next couple of months. So it's hard to know, maybe it's gonna flatten out, but I'm, based on what I'm seeing regionally and nationally, I'm not expecting that it's going to. Just wanna be sure we're, we're, we're being proactive, uh, Ms. Bergstrom, not sort of reactive and then find ourselves stuck because we don't have the resources we need. Thank you, Mr. Nixon. Um, seeing no additional questions, um, Dr. Evans, if you if you want, oh, I, I see an additional question, Ms. Bolognese. Um, <clears throat> I'm just wondering, uh, so I know we had said that we would just ask uh, the Director of Public Health, Jim Murphy, to come and join our meetings throughout the fall, but I personally have found the information that she's brought to us and commented on over the past several months very useful um, and I am wondering what we we are whether we would plan to do that going forward so speaking as chair I will say that um, I will continue to invite her on uh, an as needed basis and give her the opportunity to attend when she can. She doesn't report to us. So if she has another meeting, she can't necessarily attend our schedules. Whereas everybody else in this room reports to Dr. Evans who reports to us. So when she says there's, we say there's a meeting, they sort of show up. <laughs> um, uh, so in that regard, I will continue to invite her um, periodically. Uh, there will be also times when I invite her and she says, I have nothing to tell you. And so if that's the case, um, I will continue to, um, uh, she continues to always accept uh, uh, communications directly from us. And I would encourage, um, for instance, Mr. Nixon to reach out and ask what a December number is gonna look like. When are those gonna be uh, published if he's so inclined? <clears throat> um, so I, I think that we will continue to have her come um, periodically. We've made a, a standing meeting agenda item of COVID-19 district update. And so at any time that she's able to attend, she will always have a slot to slide right into. Um, although I will say that if she does come, I'll move her to the first agenda item because she's a, um, a busy individual and I don't want to take more of her time than necessary. Thank you for the clarification. You're welcome. Seeing no more additional questions now, Dr. Evans. Okay, so moving on to student learning time. So kind of unexpectedly, um, you might remember sometime in November, uh, in response to concern that some districts had not moved to any in-person learning, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education collected data uh, related to how many hours typical students were spending in direct instruction, either remote, fully remotely or in person with a teacher, and how many hours they were working um, independently. Uh, and so, as you might imagine, there are wide uh, variances in this, although there are very, very few districts that have students back for more hours than we have. Um, and some of that is simply a function of resources, staffing, funding, and space. Um, and so, uh, 
the state collected this data and then went to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, the Board of Ed, the State Board of Education, and in an effort to compel those districts who were not providing enough what they call synchronous learning, face-to-face or uh, full remote directly to one teacher to student, um, they passed some emergency regulations in relation to this. As you might imagine, superintendents were a little taken aback that the previously approved plans now um, needed to be adjusted in some districts. Fortunately, um, uh, I believe we're meeting the targets set by the uh, Board of Ed um, more easily at the middle and high school level than the elementary level. Um, but uh, I, I applaud their efforts to recognize that um, the foundation of effective education is the relationship between a student and a teacher. However, some of their motivation for wanting to do this was pediatricians who were uh, sending out strong cautions that students were experiencing a lot of mental health issues in relation to not being in school and therefore compelling them to be in school more would um, help address those issues. We all agree that we want students to be in school as much as possible um, when it is safe to do so. And so the student learning time regulations, ironically, are most easily met in full remote districts where you can have one teacher working with large numbers of students for many hours on screens all day long if you are so inclined. So I think in their efforts to try to standardize the number of hours that students have with their teachers, they're kind of missing the boat. However, it's, I don't think it's an issue for us because I think we'll be able to meet their expectations, but it's a distractor that districts don't need trying to scramble to comply with regulations that are well-intentioned but misguided. Um, and so MASC and MASS personnel understand the complexities of this and they understand that we're open for as much as it is safe to do so. And so um, there is a pathway for us to ask for um, an exemption if we believe the evidence shows that our students are well served. I believe that our students are well served. Our recent surveys show that there are many parents who would like their students to be in school for more days. Um, but there are many others who are very happy with the current um, services that they're getting. The group of students that I think are doing unexpectedly well are the couple of hundred students in the district who are coming for four full days, who are getting lots of individual attention and reinforcement. And I think Pam could speak to that success. Um, and, in, and in many cases, for the two full days when our students are present, because the numbers are low, they're getting a lot of individual attention and are learning at a faster pace than they perhaps would in a class of 22 students um, where there are lots of other distractors and less teacher go around. And so there, there are some silver linings here. We're still working towards increasing in-person time and I can't wait for everybody to get vaccinated so that we can all feel safer to, to be back fully in person. Um, but I just wanted to raise awareness of this student learning time regulation express my concern that um, it was uh, passed without any communication or consultation with the people who are actually doing the work in schools. Um, and is I think it's misguided. And so um, trying to shame districts into bringing students back more is just not the way, the best way to do that. So if you have any questions about it, I'd be happy to answer it, but that's about all. Open to questions from the committee, Ms. Marchant. I want to say two things. First of all, I would encourage families to look at this dashboard because it highlights how um, right on target, given all of the insanity around COVID-19, how on target Winchester staff has gotten our students to. And so Number one, it's it's another badge of honor of how well our staff has done, our administration. Um, number two, it's, again, it goes to the fact that the people who need to be heard are not being heard. And that's the people on the front lines, the teachers, the staff, the educators, and the public health officials. Rather, we're, we're just reacting without thought. And so... 
I implore the state to be a lot more thoughtful and to stop throwing us under the hypothetical or the figurative bus uh, when it comes to the public perception of what's happening in public schools. Our children are being served incredibly well. Even our, our typical learners are getting this very concentrated, like Dr. Evans was just saying, this concentrated focus. Our teachers are happy with the class sizes in this pandemic. It is a system, the hybrid model is a system that is working for most families. And those families for whom it's not working, I again implore and encourage you to reach out to the teachers and the administration because they are best placed to serve your needs. Our administration has looked at all the budget implications and is working again within a very conservative budget, but the the impact and the work is high class. It is, I would compare it to any other district and say we, our kids are being served incredibly well. And so even though this tool should backfire on the, <laughs> the um, state for their, the way they handle and respond to these things, I think it is a good tool to then again say to our families who have asked for full remote, our families who have asked for full in person, and don't believe us <clears throat> when we say the time that the kids are getting is very rich and they're getting the education they need to maintain where they need to be, this is another indicator that shows that that's true, that this is a fact, that our kids are being well served and they are being met where they need to be met by our staff. And so I wanna thank our staff for jumping on the hybrid model and still serving a fully remote model and the four day model. I mean, I, I want people to understand how complex the system is, yet our district is managing it well. And so thank you to our staff and the state. We need them to do a much better job, a much more thoughtful job, one that reaches out to schools and asks them where they're at. Because right now we see the inequities statewide. Forget within districts, the, the statewide inequities are horrific. And so I think the state would better serve the students if it looked at that more closely. Thank you, Ms. Marchant. Additional questions or comments on this? Seeing none, uh, back to you, Dr. Evans. Sure. Uh, so funding, I'd like just to briefly um, alert you that I do have an expectation that we'll receive some, addition, some significant additional funding this year that has to be used for COVID related expenses, pandemic related expenses. And what I would propose that we do is retain a significant percentage of that um, to create a really robust summer program, um, either um, online uh, or in person um, uh, with appropriate mitigation measures um, to address remediation uh, concerns, um, particularly for our younger learners. Uh, and so if there's an additional source of funding for this summer program, I think we can do something really innovative and exciting. And so um, that is something to look forward to, uh, to give our students a jump start, so that when I hope we're all able to return fully in the fall, that we'll be able to um, make good progress. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Uh, questions? About that? Yes, Mr. Nixon. So Dr. Evans, would that, would that basically be our usual EYP program, but one with let's say lower barriers to entry, or are you talking, if, if I can phrase it that way, or are you thinking of something unique as a one-off for the coming summer that's gonna grab more students and seek to accomplish maybe some different goals? Can you talk a right. little more about that? So the um, PM can speak to the creation of the EYP program for students with disabilities. Um, we always have students who are at risk of regression and need to be involved in a summer program. <clears throat> What I would say is um, many of those students are actually doing better now under our current system than they would have done in a typical school year. So EYP may even look different. Um, I suspect there'll still be some service providers and students who'll need to do a remote EYP and not an in-person EYP. So that'll complicate it. No, I think I'm, I'm proposing depending on the available funding and staffing levels 
something pretty widespread that would be open to many, many students. Um, and so central office needs to brainstorm about this. We need to see what the available funding is first. Um, and then we can start to outline the perimeters of the program. But I feel pretty excited that we could do something robust in the summer to engage students um, and, uh, and give them a jump start for the fall. Thank you. Dr. Evans, Thank you. Ms. I, have a, I have a question about that too. And I hear that you're also saying that this is something you've just brainstormed and don't have a lot of details on yet, mm -hmm. but um, um, versus using that money um, in the spring when COVID counts might be lower to bring back more students um, or to look at an option options for that um, versus a summer program, do you anticipate being able to get um, staffing over the summer when our teachers, as Zena has um, adequately um, expressed, are working incredibly hard this year? Many of them might need a summer break that would typically be available for ESY. We can't get substitutes now. Is that is it realistic to think we could create a large scale program like that this summer and have enough staffing to be able to do it versus versus investing that money, say, when we could be in a regular school year? Sure. So I would envision it as partially remote, um, kind of individualized tutoring and or support and partially in person. Um, certainly some of the funding could and will be used to hire additional staff if we can get them for the spring. Um, but the, um, my concern is that we have students, particularly early literacy um, uh, results for some of our K-1 students indicate that they could really use a boost in the summer. We've always run a reading program in the summer. I just wanted to see if we could expand it and make it much more robust. Um, Lori Kirby has pulled a rabbit out of a hat more times than I can recall and, this, and we have a couple of staff members who are not, who are teaching for us, who don't work in the state and one who doesn't even work in the country. And so um, our, if we uh, have a, re a remote portion of this program, we have the capacity to hire from anywhere to, to help support that. That really expands the, the base of potential supports that we can offer. We're much uh, more limited when we wanna bring people in in person, um, particularly in the spring. And I think there'll be more people willing to come in in the summer once our teachers are vaccinated. Um, and so that's a, that's a hopeful sign too, but it's gonna require significant funding mm -hmm. and the town certainly doesn't have the resources to do it nor this, does the school department. So um, I'm hopeful that we can plan to do something that will meet the needs of individual students and families in the summer and something that's innovative and exciting and fun. So, Thank you. Do you have a question follow up? Thank you, Ms. Bolognese. Um, Dr. Evans, but just at this point in time, though, we don't have any details on when the funding would be available or if there would be like a time limit on the funding. Like I know with uh, the CARES funding up until this point, it was um, a cutoff date of December 31st by which it had to be used. So Ellen, can you weigh in on that question? Have you heard anything further about the additional CARES money that just got passed? Federal money. No, I have not. Um, I have heard only heard that um, it was passed, and um, municipal states um, will get further information, and then it will uh, be disseminated down to municipalities and school districts. And then, so, hypothetically, if we did have a time limit on it of having to use it by June thirtieth, um, would we have to apply it this spring semester? This in the spring semester. So because the um, all the CARES money um, was extended through to December 31st of 2021, I don't foresee any additional funds that we receive um, having a um, having a deadline for use by June 30th. I, th I would anticipate that any additional funds we receive would be would have the um, the due date um, for use of December 31st, 2021, or possibly later. Um, I think that um, that people have become more cognizant of the fact that. Um, that these expenditures are going to be, you know, with us for an extended period of time. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seeing no additional questions on the funding issue, back to you, Dr. Evans. So I wanted to talk about our efforts to try to bring, uh, to increase in-person learning. And I know I've talked about a number of these repeatedly, um, so I'll just, I'll, I'll highlight them briefly. 
um, there are a number of factors that really place significant limitations on our ability to bring more students back uh, quickly. Um, the first is obviously that I've talked about earlier today, social, six, six switch social distancing and cohorting has really limited the number of students who've been identified as close contacts and thus need quarantine. And anything that we do has to keep those into consideration um, as a continuation because I think it has worked so well. There's a, the additional um, complicating factor that a significant number of our staff members, te both teachers and support staff, have medical accommodations that require them only to work remotely. Um, and middle and high school teachers teach both in-person and uh, full remote classes. And so any major changes to the student configuration in remote and hybrid um, would have a significant impact, not only on our budget, because we'd have to hire replacement teachers, but also on individual schedules. The middle and high school schedules are the least flexible because the teachers work with both of these remote and hybrid students. And it's very uh, disruptive to have to completely redo uh, a schedule and assign students to new teachers. It could mean that some students wouldn't be able to take the same courses that they're currently taking. And so even though the middle school and high school teams, administrative teams and teachers have worked through a number of scenarios, um, at this point, we think that the uh, disruption that would be caused by uh, completely blowing up our schedule and doing it over again uh, would be um, uh, too disruptive uh, to the learning of our students. And therefore, at this point, we think we're not gonna make any changes to the six through 12 schedule, except during the school day within the parameters of the regular school day. Um, and this is obviously disappointing. We still have some options available for Wednesdays. Um, but the, we've backed ourselves into some things on Wednesdays that would be problematic if we moved them. And all of this is subject to negotiation in terms of our collective bargaining uh, MOA. Um, we have moved nearly all IEP meetings to Wednesdays. Um, and we have over 800 students with disabilities who have at least one meeting per year in their annual, sometimes repeated meetings if there are issues, sometimes repeated meetings if you have a, an initial evaluation that you have to review. And so what we've tried to do is prioritize student teacher in-person instruction, not pulling teachers out of classrooms uh, to attend IEP meetings. And so therefore we've moved a lot of them to Wednesdays and scheduled out for you know months and months ahead. And so any disruption to that schedule, i.e. bringing more students back in person means that some of them, uh, some of those IEP meetings would have to be moved to days when teachers are working directly with students. Um, and so, so that's, that, that's one factor. There are also considerations for parents who have very inflexible schedules, as we found when we um, assigned the AABB cohort, that some parents are not able to move um, their individual schedules. They have learning pods or they have childcare arrangements. Um, any changes to that um, are extremely dis disruptive. We do have about 200 students. Pam, correct me if I'm wrong. Is it about 200 students on four, four full day? Four full days, yes, uh, K through 12. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, and so for many of those students, especially at the elementary level, because they're in school doing academics for four full days or special education services, they on Wednesday afternoons um, are fully engaged in doing things like music, PE, art, et cetera. So again, those Wednesday afternoons, a lot of the specialists are teaching um, so um, any changes to uh, schedules are likely to happen first at the K-5 level. Um, and I'll talk in a little more detail about some of the things we're considering for K-5 to bring more students back for more in-person time. We're continuing to look at Wednesdays. How are Wednesday mornings used for those full cohort um, check-ins or short classes, six through 12? Um, how are, is, should we add an additional check-in on a Wednesday afternoon with the classroom teachers? Right now, teachers are having to plan for two different groups of students at least um, at home and in person. Um, and so we're doing a lot of um, coordination and planning on Wednesdays as well by contract. So any changes to that, we'd have to um, re rethink how we're supporting students who are at-home learners. So uh, what I sent out yesterday was a request form to families that said, if you are thinking about changing from hybrid to remote or, or vice versa, if you would let us know, um, we'll, we'll um, get those numbers. Um, it's important for us to know those numbers because if large numbers of families decide to come back 
from full remote to hybrid. Um, uh, some of our space planning will be impacted by that. Uh, and some of the numbers will change in terms of how many students we can fit in the spaces that we have available um, on days when their teachers are working with another group of students. So um, the last thing is that I'm asked fairly regularly, why can't we just live stream? I was asked today by a high school parent. The problem is that when students are home, they have some classes that are remote classes, and um, but the, that would conflict with the other classes that they would have on their in-person days. Uh, and so even if we wanted to do that at middle and high school, it would really disrupt the overall schedule. We'd have to change the, the whole schedule to do that. But more importantly, I think live streaming a class um, really conflicts with our educational philosophy where students get a lot of individual attention. There's a lot of differentiation and teachers move about the classroom to assist individual students or small groups of students. And so we're not really set up like a college where the teacher is primarily lecturing. Lecture, if we were just going to lecture, we can just record it and you know, send it home for students to watch. Um, there are privacy concerns with live streaming. Uh, there are um, concerns with technology, which could be overcome if we thought it was worth doing. But there's a, there's a lot of stress that gets added to trying to support at-home learners and students in the classroom at the same time. And I'm not convinced that they don't all suffer um, as, a, as a consequence of that. I would find it incredibly frustrating to have a second grader at home watching the teacher work with other st individual students um, and the teacher cannot answer questions from that student. Um, and so I am not a um, big proponent of live streaming um, and uh, I don't think it works well for the kind of school district we are. So I'll leave it at that. So I want to talk, so in general, we'll do some things on Wednesdays. We're still looking at some things on Wednesdays for six through 12, but I think, it, I, think I just have to be frank and say, there's very little chance in the short term that we're going to be able to bring six through 12 students back um, for more in-person time. On the other hand, I think there's a very good chance we could bring K-1 students back for more time, either a partial day or a full day, uh, one additional day per week, if some conditions are met, like we need to hire some additional people um, and we need to have space available where the class, where the full remote numbers stay about the same. So those classrooms where they would have been are available. Um, and that there are parents who are willing to take the additional risk to have students come into the school building for an additional day and could be exposed to other people other than their typical classroom peers or teacher. So um, we'll bring in the, in the next couple of weeks after we get sort of the request process for changes of um, hybrid and remote, um, some options for bringing first our K students, perhaps our one students, and then we'll look at grades two to five, um, uh, probably later in February to see if we can provide any additional support. I'm meeting again with the elementary principals on Monday um, to review some preliminary proposals and we'll see, we'll see where we're able to go with this. But we're most concerned about our youngest learners and their literacy skills. If we can give them an extra boost in person or remotely um, through some more direct instruction, uh, that would be our number one priority right now. So uh, if there's anything um, you'd like to give me feedback on um, or ask questions about, I'd be happy to take that at this point. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Uh, questions, comments from the committee? Ms. Bergstrom. Um, Dr. Evans, you talked about providing perhaps some of this remotely. Um, mm -hmm. wouldn't, wouldn't that also then be accessible to the two five students? Because I'm imagining that there's also going to be literacy loss in that area. And I'm curious to know with the new um, the new screeners that we have in place, if we are actually in fact seeing evidence of more um, literacy um, intervention being needed already. Sure, so I'll let Jen, I think Jen signed off. I don't know if she's, she's listening, but um, if Jen, if you wanna jump in, there she is. Um, if you wanna jump in, I don't have the preliminary January report on um, our reading scores uh, as of yet, but if you wanted to talk about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think your point about we can service more students more efficiently if we do it remotely. 
um, and add perhaps and leverage those resources. Um, I think parents are anxious to have not only the services, but also the experience of being in school more days. And so we're trying to balance those two conflicting demands. Um, and Lori can weigh in as well. We have posted for additional reading support and elementary classroom teachers, um, and we're looking for more funding um, to support some of those efforts as well. So Jen, I don't know if you want to speak to what you and Katie Malone have talked about on the literacy front, K-1 especially. Sure. So, I mean, um, part of what we've been doing is tracking the data throughout the fall, right, where our students are, both in terms of our assessments, but also what teachers are seeing, where the gaps are, where the needs are. So, one of the things we've been doing, even just utilizing our current resources, is starting next week, um, students will be getting on Wednesday afternoons more support with ESPs, which is um, set up by Katie and she's putting together lessons and scripting and literally, you know, hundreds of students will have an opportunity for some more literacy time. That's not the same as, you know, direct instruction with their teacher or with um, a reading specialist, but it's certainly something that's proven effective to bolster and give them more support um, in using the resources that we have. Um, so we've already been in the process of identifying students that are, um, could use some extra support um, and putting some things in place for that. So I think we'd be, you know, well, well ready to um, put any intervention in place that we could based on funding or personnel or any of those pieces because we've already been looking at the data and we've already identified not just who needs what, but what their needs are and what would be most helpful. And I guess, Jen, I was wondering if that's a greater number of kids than you've seen in previous years, or if um, this seems to be on track with what we've seen. Uh, no, or sure. I think for that. Yeah, I think especially it, with the younger students, um, you know, we've seen, um, you know, when we do our assessments, students get a level, but we always try to be very, very clear that that, <laughs> that level is that letter. Time. Yeah, exactly. Um, that really the most helpful thing about our assessment is identifying where their strengths are and where their needs are. Um, so certainly just from the gap um, in educational time that they've had throughout the spring and, you know, obviously we always see a little bit with the summer and those pieces as well. Um, certainly we see that their quote unquote scores across the board, our numbers are lower. Um, but I also think that um, it's hard to judge. <laughs> you know, I think we have to be careful of uh, causation assumptions when they could just be correlations. Right. There's a lot going on in the world right now that's much beyond just time in school. So um, I'm not sure that even if we were fully in school <laughs> with what's going on around the stress and all of the pieces that come for all of us and certainly our students around the pandemic, around you know, social justice issues, about politics, with all of that going on in the world, um, there's good research to show that that affects academics um, that really isn't necessarily about time in school or not. So I'm not saying it's one way or the other. I'm just saying I think we have to be careful of thinking A will equal B. <laughs> right. Because um, it's not necessarily causation. It could just be correlational at this point. And um, I know we've done a lot of work over the last few years with trauma-informed instruction as well. Is that helping with um, thinking and thinking about any of these issues, at, particularly at elementary school? Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, certainly, I think that's really helped our teachers shape their perspective and then also give some approaches. Um, so again, the same, you know, again, it's a natural thing that we do sometimes, uh, an assumption of causation. So a student is exhibiting this behavior or showing this, so that must mean this. Um, and a lot of the uh, PD and the education around kind of that trauma base helps you to not make those assumptions or not make those stories up and understand where it might be coming from. And 
all the latest brain research that really helps us understand how much stress and anxiety actually impact your ability to learn, to retain, to go into that long-term memory, especially, which we know is huge for reading in particular. Um, so thinking about those pieces and trying, that's why we talk so much about, obviously, the social emotional pieces, building that community, that foundation, all of that, when that's in place, then they're more likely to be able to gain the skills that they need to gain academically. So I think all of that training has helped people see those pieces, which I think informs the practice and helps us talk with parents about different things, right, and come at things differently that way, too. Thank you. Sure. Additional questions from the committee? Ms. Marchant? Um, to follow up, Jen, is it true that um, things like resiliency and, and some of the playing time benefits and all of that are harder to measure than something um, like literacy? So some of the positives may not be as obvious early on, or is there ways that we can look at that and reflect on that? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think that's something we're grappling with in education, not just like in Winchester across the board, right? How do we measure those pieces? Um, not so much for measurement sake, but to know what's working, what we're making progress on, what we still need to work on. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, in terms of kind of qualitative data, we see lots of pieces with students that we're seeing gains around resiliency, it, particularly in areas of independence, right? One of the, um, I'll say, I don't want to say a negative, but one of the drawbacks to the way education has run for many years is there's not a lot that students need to navigate themselves, especially during the day, right? We're scripting everything. We're, um, and so now they're learning different skills, which is really what people expect out in the real world, right? About managing yourself, about setting your own goals, about time management. And yeah, we see struggles with that. You know, we talk a lot about um, students not being able to manage. That's, that's what's supposed to happen, right? We're supposed to see, this is the time we should see those struggles so we can help them navigate that and figure out what works for them and what's their best strategy so they can take that into the rest of their life. Um, so I think a lot of those skills are, like you said, harder to measure, but we certainly are seeing that. And sometimes mm -hmm. it looks negative, like people are saying, my kids can't manage this, so they can't. Exactly. That, that's actually, like that discomfort, that's where the growth comes. Like that's right, a time that right. we see as like progress. Because um, right. if we smooth it over, then they don't have that opportunity for growth. So there's a balance, which is why... Yeah. It's such an art, right? It's so hard because you don't want to stress them too much, but you, you want that little bit of stretching and growth themselves. So I hope that, you know, we all use the, the phrase executive functioning sometimes without really understanding it. But I hope that, that parents allow their kids to learn how to fail yeah. and to learn how to make these mistakes and to accidentally miss a Zoom class and then realize what their schedule looks like. I feel like um, we as parents need to learn to manage our own expectations. <laughs> right. And I hope that the message gets out to families that it's okay if the middle school, I hear this all the time, the middle school schedule is overwhelming you. It's okay if your child struggles <laughs> through it. It'll right. be okay. They'll survive and they'll learn their own time right. management skills. So in the future, if parents allow their children to go through that very difficult, painful process, <laughs> yes. they'll see the benefit of, right. you know, executive functioning all right. of a sudden is like, well done. Technology use is well done by our children. And so I really hope that that message is getting across too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Additional questions on this area? So, Dr. Evans, this is, a, I mean, we, were, we just went from a very high level now to a very, you know, granular question or comment, or um, I, I do see um, you say likely some, at the 6 to 12 level, likely some modifications to the use of Wednesdays to increase student-teacher contact time. Um, without telling us what, what that plan is, um, I'm, I'm curious how one could actually increase student contact time, given that at least at the high school level, um, 
uh, pretty much the whole day has student contact time. I'm wondering what, what the thought is behind that. So on Wednesdays, uh, we have some opportunities to um, add additional support in the afternoons for high, middle and high school students. Um, much as you know, uh, Jen just talked about using our um, ESPs, our teaching assistants, to reach out and provide direct instruction to kids at home. Um, it may be that we'll be able to add an additional opportunity for students either in person or at home on Wednesdays. Um, uh, that, that is really the only flexible time we have. Really the other four full days, teachers are nonstop teaching the entire day without a break. Um, and so uh, it is, um, there's not a lot of flexibility there. The high school is too small. There are too many students to bring more students back in person. It's the same with the middle school. Um, and so I know that's very disappointing, um, but until, and I'm not saying it's not, we're not going to do anything for the remainder of this school year, but it looks increasingly unlikely. Um, it looks like the vaccination schedule uh, is a lot slower in its rollout than we had anticipated. And un unless that accelerates and we have a lot more teachers vaccinated, um, we'll continue to have a large percentage of our staff who can only teach remotely. Um, we'll continue to have a large percentage of our students who are remotely taught as well by their choice. So, um, so we don't have a lot of flexibility six through 12. So we may be able to do some things on Wednesdays. I didn't talk about um, you know, this sort of softening of the rules about students coming in for additional help from teachers on other days, which we are doing at the high school level. Um, and I know Dennis um, Mahoney and James Lynn are really trying to think outside the box in order to be sure that students get contacted on their at-home days. Um, it's just, it's a staffing issue. We just don't have the bodies to um, provide those supports. Um, ironically, everybody could get more teacher contact time if we were full remote but we don't want to sacrifice that in-person time. We think that's crucially important. Thank you. No, I, I would just, I would add one last thing is that on Wednesdays, you know, as a, a personal experience, as a father of two high schoolers, um, they have a lot of uh, teacher contact time on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Is uh, That was my main point, I guess, was I don't see a lot. There's not a lot of room to expand on Wednesdays for, for my two children that, mm -hmm. that you know, your mileage may vary. So I just wanted to... Uh, throw that out and see if there's something I'm out of the box I'm not thinking of, but there, there, there likely is. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bolognese. Thank you. I just had a question. Uh, you had mentioned the survey that had gone out yesterday to the community. And could you just uh, talk a little bit about what the ramifications, what the impact might be if one chose to move from hybrid to remote or mm -hmm. from remote to hybrid. Right. Um, just in so, terms of teacher change, mm -hmm. I think you mentioned teacher changes. Um, yeah, we'll start there. Oh, right, so okay. So I, so I think that this is something that I'm getting a lot of parent questions about and that I have tried to answer, but uh, James Lynn is sending out today a guideline, some guidelines for parents that is much more sort of um, concrete so the reality is a switch from hybrid to remote or back um, to hybrid um, during the school year is highly disruptive and will likely require a change in teacher. Um, so if you're an elementary student, K to five, and you want, you're want you currently full remote and you'd like to go to hybrid, um, there may be a chance that there's not space available for you to do that because the, student, the classrooms have the maximum number at the school that you've been assigned to. It, it may require you to go to a different school. It may not, um, but in any case, it will require you to change a teacher in all of your classmates. Um, some parents have asked, could they go full remote for a, a certain period of time and then come back? Unfortunately, that's not really possible either because, and not, and not advisable because changing teachers three times in a school year is highly disruptive. Um, so, uh, so it's a decision that should not be made lightly. Um, at the six through 12 level, the ramifications are even more serious. Um, it may be that the courses that you currently have are not available if you choose the other option, either full remote. There may not be, it, especially at the middle school level, a lot of the hybrid classrooms are already completely full. Like you cannot put another student in there and safely maintain six feet of distancing. So it may mean that you'll have to change teams. Um, 
And if we had large numbers, it may mean that we have to hire additional teachers, which is a very significant expense that we haven't budgeted for. So moving models is something that should be done um, if it's in the best interest of the student, only after a lot of thought and deliberation. So the um, form that I sent yesterday is a change request form. It's not a survey. So it should only be completed by families who really have made the decision that they understand the impl implications of moving from one model to the other and, and not by people who have the expectation that it's only going to be a temporary measure that they'll try out and then go back to the other model. The mm -hmm. staffing, particularly for students who get specialized services, and that's 25% of our kids, get some kind of specialized service, either special education or reading or EL, or even more than 25% um, at the elementary level um, that are already in place will have to be changed for students. So it's not only changing your core teacher or your classes, but also your specialized services. It's a highly disruptive process. And um, so, uh, it, you know, we've been able to accommodate a number of people who asked to move to remote or to hybrid early on at the K-5 level, um, but it's, it's a, it's, the stakes are way higher at the middle and high school. And so um, we'll have the school personnel reach out to the, to the families who complete the forms and let them know um, what is available and what the timeline is and, and where we're going. And if it does require us to hire additional staff, then um, the families will need to wait until the staff members are hired. Thank you both. Uh, oh, follow-up question? Oh, sorry. Yes, by all uh, means. I muted myself, I exited it again. Um, and if you had families that are changing from hybrid or are thinking about changing from hybrid to remote, um, is that, uh, I, I, is there a limit on the number of students who could be with a teacher, with a remote teacher? Or are there less constraints around that? Well, we try not to exceed the school committee guidelines on class sizes, but there are some full remote sections that are quite large. Some of it depends on the availability of the specialists who also serve those classrooms or whether the child needs to be placed in a co-taught classroom. Um, so there are a lot of restrictions often that you don't see. Um, even just to get counseling full remote is more difficult. Um, some students just have counseling as an IEP service, for example. So, um, so there, uh, it's, it, it is disruptive because it means changing teachers and classmates. Um, and there are, but there are ample seats probably at full remote at the K-5 level, at least, you know, at least. And at the high school level, some of the full remote classes are quite large. Um, and so, uh, Again, not and 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 you not all classes are available remotely. So some students have an in-person class that may not also be available remotely. So making that decision is is again one that should be made with caution. And that's the same at the middle school level too, I assume. Yeah, so. particularly for things like world language or electives. Yep. Great. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions on? This, I, this is the end of the report that you're giving us. Any additional questions or seeing none? Thank you, Dr. Evans, for this report. And uh, as I said at the, uh, up front, the, this is a continuing item that we will have, which is uh, COVID-19 uh, update. So thank you for everything you did there. And uh, I would like to move on to the next agenda item, which is the... Vote to approve the revised job descriptions. These are the job descriptions that you came to us um, uh, uh, three weeks ago now, and there were some comments and some feedback. And uh, I'll turn it over to you if there's anything you want to tell us about what's changed or what's uh, how how what's different from what we saw last time. Sure. So um, we've cleaned this up a bit uh, uh, in accordance with some of the feedback that we got in terms of formatting. Uh, there's also a flowchart that shows the technology positions in the district and the reporting um, ch chain. As you can see, it's not a lot of people support technology for thousands of users. Um, uh, I did get a uh, suggestion from Mr. Nixon um, regarding, shortly before this meeting, regarding the position title of Coordinator of Digital Learning and Innovation. Um, the innovation piece of this is not as, um, uh, well described in some of the essential duties and responsibilities because defining innovation is 
um, a little tricky. Uh, he suggests it might be better called coordinator of digital teaching and learning. Um, and since Jen and Lori and Ellen all participated in the creation of these job descriptions, I just wanted to give them an opportunity to weigh in on that comment. But that was the only comment I got from school committee. Well, and can okay. I just in and say that there was That's really excellent. a question. It was a question I was throwing out there just because digital learning appears so frequently through the actual job description and at, as opposed to innovation. But I, I figured there might be some calculus in leaving the title the way it is. So um, Dr. And Ellen Emma got back to me and I, I think she prefers oh. to keep it that way. I'm totally on board. I just wanted to ask the question. Innovation is, you know, an oft used and squishy word, and some people might say even a little bit worn out. It's like you know, director of thinking out of the box or something. Um, but it, it it just comes down to I think the kind of candidate we're trying to attract, and the emphasis or importance that we put on that word, even though it doesn't really show up in the body of the document. So I'm not. It was really a question I was asking of you guys. I just want to make sure you got your question answered. So if you if it's been answered. I'd be happy to take any other suggestions or, um, and someone had asked a question earlier, how soon are we planning to hire for these positions? As soon as possible. Um, and so we'd, we'd love you to support this. What I would say is based on, like any other job description, if we find that it's missing something or needs to be expanded, we'll come back to you and, you know, if we look at a mismatch between the candidates that we're seeing, we'll, we'll take another look at it. I would Thank just you, like Dr. to know, I appreciate the changes in terms of the format of these, kind of the consistency where we're boiling down essential duties as to other responsibilities and the flow chart that um, I think I had requested is there. I think it's very helpful. I appreciate that. I support it. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Nixon. Ms. Bergstrom. Just really quickly, um, thank you for, I'm glad to hear uh, that Dr. Ellen Emma wants to keep the innovation in. I think that's an important part, even if it's not well-defined. I think whoever we look for through interviewing and hiring, the innovation piece of it will um, become clear to us too as we move along. And I think it leaves it more open-ended um, a little bit for us to, um, since it's a new position to define it too. Um, I, I, to follow up on your comment, Dr. Evans, I just was wondering, as soon as we approve these, will they be posted? And are both of these positions still um, able to be funded out of this current year's budget? Yes. Excellent. To both? Yes. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. That'd be yes and yes. Yes and yes. Uh, thank you. Additional questions on uh, these two job descriptions? Mr. Can I Nixon? follow up on uh, Ms. Bergstrom's question? Do we have a preference to fill one position before the other? Uh, like, I'll let, I'll let Jen in. Operationally, would it make sense to fill one before the other? Jen, I don't know if you want to answer that one. Uh, we'd love to have both. Um, I will say that the, um, although I think uh, educationally, the um, digital learning and innovation is like more important in that realm. But based on what we have in the district right now, none of us are network experts. And um, I'm trying to learn about networks. It's not going well. So I think that one would be more urgent because we don't really have any expertise um, in the district on that, where for the other pieces, there's many of us that can help fill that. Um, so I would say that's the more urgent one, but I, I think it'll just depend on the pool, what could come before the other. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, if seeing no additional questions, this is an action item. So I'd be looking for a motion. I'm happy Thank to you. make the motion. Thank I move you. to approve the job descriptions for the administrator of information technology services and network manager and the coordinator of digital learning innovation as presented. I'll second that. We require a roll call vote. Mr. Nixon. Aye. Ms. Marchant. Aye. Ms. Bergstrom. Aye. Ms. Bolognese. Aye. Chair votes aye. The vote is unanimous. Thank you for bringing these back and making the changes as su requested, suggested, uh, very helpful. And uh, we look forward to having um, these uh, staff members on next week, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. Can I ask Mr. Chairman, just a, a, another question related to this, how, how widely are we searching to fill these two positions? Um, you know, would we consider uh, 
more of a national search, just given how the talent pool maybe is shallow. It's hard to find in these times. Uh, Lori can speak to that. Well, I, I think we want the person, you know, we certainly can be hybrid. We have discussed, you know, can it be all remote? Could it be a combination of the two? Um, we are putting feelers out everywhere. So when we um, advertise on school spring, that automatically goes to Indeed. We've put it out on the mass superintendents list, and we've also put it out on the HR list. Like every other position that we've talked about this year, we're not alone in our search for technicians of any kind in districts and having school technicians versus private technicians there's certainly a different uh, skill set but also the compensation is different so this is where we're running into um, many issues as as we you know um, go forward with with these positions Ellen and uh, Jen have been working tirelessly um, to uh, fill that technician position that we've had open now for, uh, you know, just a few weeks. It's, it's not easy. But if anyone has any ideas, we're always open to, you know, thinking, thinking about those and um, looking for new direction. Thank you, Ms. Kirby. Ms. Kirby is, um, do you feel like the, um, we are limited by um, the salaries that we range that we are looking for? And no, I Oh, I'm sorry, Michelle. Go ahead. That's okay. And um, and if we are, Dr. Evans, do we have the flexibility in the budget to increase our our salary range on either of those positions? Yeah. So I, I think Lori would say yes. Um, we've increased the salary for the technician positions, which are really help desk, basic level tech support, and not meant to be you know, kind of a, it meant, it's meant to be an entry level position. Um, but uh, unfortunately, if we were to pay these positions, the market rate that they get in industry, um, some of these positions would make more than any of our administrators um, right, right. or the superintendent. <laughs> uh, and so um, it just becomes un unmanageable. Um, and so uh, what we're trying to do is, uh, increase the technician salaries, you know, to, to make market adjustments, both for our existing employees and to continue to attract. It seems pretty clear for that, for our most entry level technical positions um, that we need to pay them more if we're gonna attract anybody to even apply um, with any skills. The position, the ranges, salary ranges that I've, you know, proposed for the network administrator and the director of uh, technology innovation, um, uh, again, those are school year positions that are in line with what our assistant principals make. And without making a major um, salary market adjustment for all of our district level and school level administrators, it's hard to boost, boost those over our existing personnel. That's the reality of working in schools, unfortunately, public education. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Evans. Um, Seeing no further discussion on this, we'll move on to the next agenda item. Now I see that on the printed copy, we have chair report and superintendent report. And on the electronic copy, we have superintendent report followed by chair report. So I'm going to let go with the superintendent report first, followed by the chair report. So Dr. Evans. Sure, thank you very much. So um, I have sent notice to school committee and to our parent community and to our staff uh, today that I have made a decision which I think a lot of um, folks expected to see coming. Um, at the time I came to Winchester, I hoped to finish my career here. Um, and when I signed my most recent contract extension, um, it was with the aim of uh, retiring after 35 years uh, in education, that time has come. So I will be um, retiring at the end of this school year. Um, I would uh, want to make sure that you all know how very appreciative I am to have had this opportunity, how honored I have been to serve as superintendent in Winchester and in other districts um, as a public school educator. Um, public schools changed my life as a child who grew up with very little public schools and libraries, uh, gave me a window into a world that enabled me to be a successful professional and a well-rounded person. And so I've been deeply committed to public education for the past 35 years. Um, and uh, I look forward to assisting in the transition to a new uh, district leader. The district is in great shape. We have an amazing community 
wonderful teachers and support staff and administrators. And so I'm confident that we're well set up for success. Um, but I wanna thank you for your support and let the community know uh, that the time has come for me to focus on health and family. And, and um, after uh, many, many years, the last 13 as superintendent of watching every snowflake, I'm looking forward to a full night's sleep <laughs> in the winter time, especially. So thank you for your support. And again, whatever I can do to assist in the transition, I will. I certainly will work tirelessly until June 30th to support the district as I have for many, many years. Thank you. Dr. Evans, um, move on to chair report. Um, you know, I, I wrote down something to say because I knew I wouldn't be able to say it off the cuff. Um, you know, Dr. Evans has been, and continues to be consummate professional and a good friend and will be missed by the district. Her steady hand during the past six years, but especially during this pandemic year are greatly appreciated and replacing her will be impossible but I'd like to assure everyone that we will immediately begin the process of finding an interim and eventually permanent successor to Dr. Evans. We'll have ample opportunity later to express our sadness at Dr. Evans' departure and to further celebrate her accomplishments. But we have a lot of work to do for the next six months. So I think that um, I personally will um, hold off on uh, saying anything more at this point in time and just say that, that when you do leave, we, you will be missed. Thank you. Um, I was asked by another member of the committee if they could say a few words during the chair report. So I will ask Ms. Marchant if she would like to um, speak. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Brian. Um, I am incredibly saddened by the news of your retirement, Dr. Evans. Um, I don't know how we would have gotten through this pandemic without your leadership. Uh, I also have decided not to run for re-election come March. Um, and I just want to say the last three years have been very rewarding. The best part was having the privilege to work with our wonderful and talented staff. The administrators, teachers, and staff are wholeheartedly dedicated to our students and community. Our superintendent is a true professional and expert education leader. I'm grateful to all of you, the administration, central office, everyone, uh, for giving me this window into public education and teaching me so much. Um, anyone privileged enough to serve in this role, even though it is a volunteer position, you end up walking away with a lot more than you give. And it's thanks to public educators, and I will forever be your strongest supporter, your advocate. I will fight for funding and um, so much, so much of what I will do in the future is based on what I've learned from you. And so with my deepest gratitude and appreciation to all of you, um, this decision was hard, but it was time. And so I look forward to the next few months of really getting into the budget and all of the work we have left. Um, and so thank you guys, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Marchant. Uh, you and I both joined the school committee three years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And during this past three years, you've been a passionate defender of our children in Winchester and children all over the state. Um, you've also become a good friend. Um, you'll be missed deeply at this table. In the same vein, as, as I said with Dr. Evans, we'll have an opportunity for good violators. There's a lot of work that we need to do now in what will be our final three months. Um, so I, uh, I look forward to those months and, uh, and I appreciate your decision. Thank you for letting us all know. You will be missed. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Um, one last thing on the chair report. <laughs> we have office hours tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Uh, I figured I should throw that out there. I will be attending. Um, I, I suspect um, we're, we're planning on Ms. Bologna is attending as well. There might be some reason that she might not be able to, in which case Ms. Bergstrom has offered to step up. So thank you all. Um, Point of information on that too, Mr. Chairman. So so this, this one, what I see is posted on the government calendar. So just to clarify again, all school committee members can log in to listen in. Is that right? I just want to be sure I understand what the rules are. That is, that is correct. This is a publicly posted meeting. I would ask 
um, that since we're not allowed to deliberate, uh, well, we are allowed to deliberate, but because it's not posted as a school committee meeting in that there's no agenda items, we couldn't deliberate on any particular topics. If you do attend um, and you are not one of the two members, I would ask that it's scheduled as a webinar format. I would ask that you stay in the audience and not ask to come in to the, um, uh, sit at the table. So we sort of have a theoretical, we have a table, which is our, uh, panelists, and we have an audience, which is the attendees, I would ask that you stay as an attendee. Again, it is posted such that if you came in, we would be able to, um, to have you allow you. I just think it's cleaner if we don't do that. So I would ask that uh, as a uh, favor to keep everything clean. Thank you. And I will point out that for um, uh, office hours, we have many members of the public who come and sit as attendees the entire office hours. They want to hear what's happening, but they don't necessarily want to partake of the discussion. Um, and uh, so uh, that's all. I, I'll just add that. Um, moving on, we have uh, our future meeting dates on January 19th, which is two weeks from today. We have our budget hearing at 6 p.m. That's been posted in the newspaper uh, as well. And following that, immediately following the budget hearing, we will have a regularly scheduled meeting. So that'll be one Zoom link for both. So you, um, anybody who wants to come to the budget hearing can just stay in the same Zoom link and follow up for the uh, meeting. And then we'll have a meeting on the 26th. Um, both of those meetings are at 6 p.m. Um, excuse me, the budget hearing starts at six and the meeting is immediately after and the meeting on the 26th at 6 p.m. Uh, and I skipped the future agenda items, my apologies. Um, we uh, anticipate a Lynch update. There's been a lot happening behind the scenes on Lynch. And so I'd like to have a Lynch update as soon as we can uh, reasonably with something to actually to update people. I don't wanna have an update that's just all the things we don't know. I'd like to have something to update. Um, and then we really are looking forward to a mascot logo update in the near future. So um, are there additional items that people are looking to add? Uh, Ms. Marchand. <laughs> Uh, a letter just came out um, from uh, Commissioner Riley. I would like to assess it. He did not go far enough, in my opinion, in terms of MCAS. And so I would like to have that discussion on the impact it will have on our schools, please. Uh, uh, can we take, can I take a look at, look at it? I have not seen what Absolutely. it is, and, and then we can uh, decide where, how that fits in as we move Absolutely. forward. Absolutely. If you didn't get it, I'm happy to forward it to you. I was just going to ask if Dr. Evans could forward that if if Miss Mar well yeah if Dr. Evans could forward that to the school committee if she's familiar with what Zena's talking that, about that would be helpful we can all that would that would be ideal yes so that we could all take a look at that thank you uh, Mr. Then, Nixon yeah so I was just going to pile on I, I it might be helpful to add general capital projects update we do have some stuff going on at Morocco um, I've had some communication with um, management at Town Hall around the Lincoln project as well. Um, and there is the prospect, I've had a conversation with the chair about this, it, going back to how Dr. Evans led off the meeting tonight um, with more focus on the potential for a future override. Um, there, there is now beginning to be some more focused conversation um, at the select board table about how to pay for the Morocco culvert. That's a 10 to $11 million project. Uh, there's interest in keeping the ball rolling on the Morocco Life Extension Program. Uh, that's, you know, a three, three and a half, four million dollar investment, depending on scope. And we have some needs at Lincoln, um, as well as at Manchester Field. So um, some have suggested the potential even for a joint meeting at some point. But but at the very least, maybe just general capital projects update. Uh, Brian, I could put something together with Ellen to, to bring to the committee. And we just got to find a way to keep the conversation going about how we bring an override into focus, both on the operating and the uh, debt exclusion front. Chris, I wonder where we where we are with Carriage House too. That would be included in the capital projects update. Yep. Thank thank, thank you both. Um, would that be just so as I think of timing? Could that be more like a January twenty sixth as opposed to a January nineteenth? The reason I ask is with the budget hearing and pr predominant um, budget discussion will be on the nineteenth, and twenty sixth will be the budget vote, but then have more free time. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Bolognese. Um, I think we had also mentioned um, looking at a posting, the job posting for the operations director. Yes, we did. I will 
add that in. Although at this point, it'll just be there because I don't even need to add it as a future agenda item because likely if we're with any um, luck, it'll be at our next meeting, but we will see if there's time for that. And just clarify, do, do we mean job description? Job description. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, any seeing no additional comments, questions about anything, I would uh, welcome a motion to adjourn. So moved. I second. second. Uh, roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Nixon. Aye. Ms. Marchant. Aye. Ms. Bergstrom. Aye. Ms. Bolognese. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you, everyone, and good afternoon. <laughs>